Hi, welcome back to the Astro Imaging Channel. Uh, this is Adam, and uh, tonight's discussion is on observatories. And um, I have uh, prepared, and we'll see how uh, you guys like this format. But uh, in general, this isn't supposed to be a comprehensive discussion. I was just saying that. Um, feel free to ask questions. Feel free to, or a comprehensive PowerPoint. Uh, feel free to ask questions, and we can discuss whatever you want. Uh, I've built an observatory, so I've uh, had my successes and made my mistakes. So uh, maybe you can learn from that. Uh, but I'm going to switch right over there. And uh, if you guys have any difficulty seeing any of this stuff, just stop me and tell me. But you could probably see my screen that says observatories, right? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, observatories, living the easy life. Um, and that's what it is. Uh, why, would, why would you want an observatory? And when you start doing uh, observing or astrophotography and getting a bit more critical, uh, you realize that setup is a, a big deal. It takes a long time. Setting up without setting up without an observatory, well, first you're probably not uh, just a few footsteps away from where you're storing your gear. So every piece of gear you have to carry somewhere. That's your tripod, your mount, your counterweight bar, your counterweights, your telescope, your cameras, your laptop, your batteries, your cables. I'm getting tired just saying it. Um, there's a lot of stuff, and it might involve a trip to the car, our cars, um, every... Ooh, what happened there? You guys still with me? Yeah. Let me see what happened here. Okay, there we go. Let's make sure that's working. Yeah. Uh, you still see setting up without a, without an observatory, I hope. If not, you can interrupt me and say I don't see anything. I only um, see you. You see me? That's what I see is you. Okay. And we are live on on uh, you or whatever online we, because I've seen someone question when will it start. So. Hmm. Well, I see why you see me again, but I am going to. We are live according to this. Okay. And we have three viewers, so yeah, people are seeing us live. Uh, bear with me. I don't know what happened. Uh, I have to make sure my power window is open. Then I have to flip back the nuances of free technology. And hopefully you see my PowerPoint. Interrupt me if you don't. Yeah, yeah, I see it. So you, uh, you, you're taking it out of your car. You're carrying it from your garage or even from your living room. Uh, you get it all out. You set it up. Then you begin with your star alignment. Uh, depending on what mount you have, it might involve polar alignment, then star alignment. Then um, it might just involve polar alignment uh, and then a sync on your star. It kind of depends on your mount. But uh, in general, you're looking a good 30 minutes to an hour setup time. And Without a doubt, you're going to set up. And to me, it was always someone walking out and saying, it looks cloudy to me. And that's when I finally came around and said, yeah, it's not clearing up. It was supposed to clear up, and it didn't. So you're, all, you're doing this in anticipation of the clear skies. It's really hard to plan around this. Uh, and you just, you're going to do it so frequently that it's, you're, it's going to really tire you out. This is what tires out astronomers, setting up and breaking down. It's not all the stuff in between. This is what gives you the. Uh, this is what really tires you out. Setting up with an observatory. What do you do? You open the roof. You remove the lens cap. That's pretty much the most difficult thing to do in my case. You turn on the power. Thirty seconds later, you're imaging. Now, some mounts may require uh, you to do some sort of star sync, but for the most part, you're already polar aligned. You don't have to do that drift alignment. You can already be hooked up to your computer. All your cables, cabling, just takes so long. So everything's ready to go. Uh, with my mount, I turn it on and I go. I don't even have to park my mount. When I turn it on, it remembers where it should be pointing at or where it was pointing at. It knows the time it got shut off. It knows the time it started up. And it just goes right ahead and starts tracking. Um, 
it observatories make life easier and they just give you more opportunities to get in a few hours here and a few hours there. Uh, never before would I have set up if I thought it was going to get cloudy in three hours, four hours. Now if I'm chasing a target, I might say, you know what, two, three hours, that's all I need on this. Uh, I'll give it a try. So you really do, the time setup advantage is there. And that's the main advantage. There are other advantages. Observatories or are a safe place to store your equipment. I have kids in my house. I don't like storing my stuff around my kids. The hey, observatories... Um, yes? Sorry to interrupt you, but uh, you're not flipping through the screens. You're still on the setup, uh, setup without an observatory. Okay. Let's see we can, we can see your um, PowerPoint screen with all the slides on the left-hand side. Oh, okay. So you don't see... Uh, you don't see... You're not at full screen. I understand what you're saying. So let's it, see here. It should be down, like in the lower right down there, where it says 110%. See the little icons down here? Um, just to the left of 110%. Yeah, I don't quite know. Right there, those three. One of them will say full frame. See it now? No, it's still the <laughs> just still the um like a normal setup of a slideshow. Uh -huh. Yeah, I think what's happening is it's not showing. Um, it's still showing the PowerPoint window. I don't know how Alex did it last week. You probably have to share that because that's a different window, so you have to share that is one. Is it also. a completely separate window? Can I like break it away somehow? Try this. Uh, I know what I have to do. Sorry, guys, bear with me. Uh, full screen. You can see my picture just for one sec, and now you should see the right slide. Am I am I right about that? Well, now you see observatories yeah. living the easy life. Yes. And right here we're at other benefits of an observatory. Yep. There we go. Sorry about that. Uh, so other benefits of an observatory. Safe place to store your equipment. Like I said, I have kids. Um, in general, um, the transportation is the part that concerns me. Um, I could probably leave my stuff in a corner somewhere and it wouldn't get broken, but when I'm walking back and forth, uh, setting it up, that's the, the chance for everything to get broken. So by leaving it in the observatory, you're really not uh, not worrying about that. And, uh, I see I'm skipping around on my slides, but uh, your equipment doesn't have to cool down. That's really important because uh, your focus, and when I say your equipment doesn't have to cool down, you open your roof half an hour before and your equipment is pretty much at ambient temperature or outdoor temperature. It's going to cool down with the outdoors, but I have an SCT, so I've got the worst of it. And I've ever since doing the observatory, I noticed a big difference. And I used to keep my gear in my uh, in my car in my garage, which was pretty close to the outdoor temperature. It's a not heated garage. Uh, other benefits: ability to use AC power outlets. Uh, batteries can be clunky at times unless you have a really good battery box setup. And uh, I've not yet found a really good off-the-shelf battery box set up. I'm still looking for one and I'm probably going to end up building one myself. So it's convenient to use AC power. No worrying about your batteries going dead. Um, weather emergencies mean closing the roof, not breaking everything down in a hurry. And that's pretty important because uh, for the obvious reasons, uh, weather can happen and you can't, you don't want to be in a race against weather. Um, remote automation is another benefit of an, of an observatory. If you're doing remote automate, automation, it's pretty much going to be via an observatory. And I have another slide later on in the presentation about that specifically. But uh, it's a good way to get away from light pollution. So if it is feasible, 
it may be a great possibility for you. Uh, I already mentioned less transportation, less breakage. Having your stuff set up in the observatory where nobody's around it, you don't have to carry it anywhere, it's not going to break as frequently. And you can also protect your gear and yourself from bears. And that sounds obscure. I could say bears could be any animal depending on where you live. But where I live, uh, I get bears frequently. And uh, I don't live in the middle of nowhere. I don't live probably where some of, you, uh, some of the astronomers live where it's really dark. I live right next to a city. And for some reason, we have these crazy. Uh, you can see on the bottom there is a bear in my garbage. I uh, pulled it out and went for a walk. It's actually a mama bear. And there were two cubs uh, actually feeding from her right before that. And uh, one of the cubs is in the tree to the right. Um, you can see one of the bears climbing a tree right now in front of my house. If you look at the picture on the left, you'll see my fence, and it's got a little bend in it. I used to set my telescope up right where that table is. And one day, I noticed a little bump in PhD, guys, a big bump in PhD guiding. My friend was over, and I said, I think the bear's out there. And I was kind of joking, but I was kind of serious. And we went out there, and we didn't see anything. And then we noticed the bend in the fence. And the bear bumped my telescope mount and ran away. So uh, that was uh, just, just slightly bumped it, no damages. I was looking all over. I was kind of concerned, but didn't do any damage. But it was uh, interesting. Made me made me think about keeping my gear safe from animals. So you've decided you want an observatory. You have a couple options. Are, are you going to build it yourself or are you going to hire someone? Um, if you, I wouldn't have thought that I was capable of building an observatory, but that said, I've pretty much done all of the steps of, with the exception of a roof, I had pretty much done all of the steps of building an observatory at one point or another in my life. Uh, even concrete work, but I did hire someone to do my, con my concrete work. But if you do decide to do it yourself, uh, there are various kits available. Uh, and the kits are pretty much anything from plans that you can bring to a local lumber yard and buy all the parts to kits that they actually send you on a flatbed truck and you assemble. And uh, the kits are available come from a, a lots of vendors. And just to name a few, Skyshed, uh, they have the regular wood Skyshed, which is roll off roof the pod. And uh, even Technical Innovations has these automated, uh, fully remote, capable observatories that I do, I've never heard anything about, but they look pretty cool. Looks like the type of thing you could drop a thousand miles away on top of a mountain and never worry about. Um, your other option, and those kits are uh, relatively reasonably priced. Um, whether you do buy it at a lumber yard, they're, they're well designed and they're kind of feasible, uh, economically feasible and uh, worth taking a look at. A more economically feasible way would be uh, to convert a vinyl shed, uh, the type you buy at Lowe's. Um, I had considered doing that and I actually figured in my own mind that modifying the roof of a vinyl shed would make it would be more difficult than designing and building an entire observatory because it's vinyl so you don't want to cause any leaks you might end up using a lot of uh, silicone and all sorts of stuff to keep it from leaking so I, I I didn't go that route although I strongly considered it and if there was a perfect vinyl shed for conversion or perfect plans for it I might have gone that way but uh, I found that I, I comfortable working with wood, so that was kind of the way I went. And uh, your other option is to design and build from scratch, which is kind of what I did. I, I took basic shed plans and then put a roof on, put a roll-off roof on top. Uh, but you can go, you can go as far with this as you want. If you want a really nice observatory, you can get an architect and an engineer to di design something out for you. Um, or you can design yourself a shed that the roof rolls off, and that's pretty much the way I look at it, that's what I did. If you want to hire somebody, there are a few companies that will, that are pretty much experts in the field at doing this. Uh, and I'm not going to mention the ones that do professional, um, massive, million, million, million dollar observatories. Uh, these are the guys who do more residential work, so you can call them up and ask them questions and uh, 
uh, do it. But backyard observatories, um, Scott, I think it's Horseman, uh, is on the Cloudy Nights Forum, and he's uh, very helpful when you have questions. And his company comes out and does uh, pretty much builds the observatory for you. I think they require the concrete pad to be poured in advance because the concrete does have to cure. You don't want to work on uncured concrete. That was one thing that I was a little bit intimidated by. I probably would have used them, uh, but the concrete was the thing that intimidated me the most. So I hired someone to do the concrete work for me, and uh, I helped him out. Uh, we had a blowout because I designed the form and built the form, and it was my fault, but uh, we, he ended up making it work, so it was all good. Uh, the uh, Sky Shed, I believe they also will in some areas come out. Or you could hire a local contractor. Um, I also considered hiring a local contractor because I was afraid I wasn't going to be able to make it look pretty enough. Um, I think when I decided to go siding, I was less concerned about that. Uh, I used vinyl siding on mine. Um, and since I've actually had a couple local contractors ask me for some advice on uh, building or pricing or uh, giving people advice on building observatories, so and they didn't get the jobs, so I don't know what the people ended up doing, but uh, it's I guess there's some people around there looking to build observatories. Um, if you do decide to build an observatory, you have to decide what type. And uh, maybe I'll stop right now and just ask: Are there any questions? Uh, has anybody? I, I I'm behind the uh, PowerPoint wall, so I can't see if there have been any questions in chat or anything like that. I'm keeping track of that. I don't see anything right now. Thank you. Uh, I think that's Robert. Yeah. Okay. So if you're building an observatory, there are two types of observatories. There's a roll-off roof and a dome. Roll-off roofs are extremely convenient, and they exactly they are exactly what they sound like. The entire roof rolls off, and that's what I built myself. Domes are a bit more complex. Domes um, can, they have a shutter that actually opens up, and as you move the telescope, you actually have to move the shutter, or in some cases, the shutter may move itself. When you're building a, a home observatory, and I think the trend recently has been a lot more towards roll-off roof observatories, unless you have a specific reason to go to a dome, but keep one thing in mind. If you have a roll-off roof observatory and you're slewing your telescope from target to target, you don't have to move the dome. If you're imaging, the dome doesn't have to move. You still have to open the shutter. You still have to open the roof. But you don't have to have any... The, the roof can be, can be kind of dumb, and the, the dome has to be somewhat smart. So to motorize a dome, it really does cost a lot of money. To motorize a roof, it's a garage door opener. And that was the distinction that I made. Uh, I said, you know what, roll-off roofs for me. A uh, couple other benefits of a roll-off roof over a dome is if you ever do have to resell your house, uh, a roll-off roof, look at that roll-off roof photograph there. Uh, that's a nice clubhouse for a kid. Uh, you just lock down the roof and you're pretty much done. The domes are pretty much telescope observatories. Um, so they don't necessarily at the same time attract as much attention, roll-off roof observatories. Domes attract attention, which could also attract theft. Uh, I weighed a lot of these out and I was every pretty much every check, box, uh, check mark in every box was in the roll-off roof side for me. So that's why I went with the roll-off roof. This is our club's observatory, uh, the Lackawanna Astronomical Society. Actually, this is our club's, the site that our club meets at, but this is uh, Keystone College, uh, Keystone University's observatory. Uh, they fund it, and that's why our club uh, who uses this site, who doesn't own this site, gets to use such awesome equipment. There's a Paramount. Um, right now I've heard they have a Paramount MX, and uh, I haven't been up there since I got that. And then in that rear dome building is a Clark telescope. It's actually a Clark lens on a, on a newer telescope. Um, on a, I believe a Warner Swayze mount. I might be wrong about that. I'm not quite sure about the mount. But pretty cool gear. Uh, our club's lucky to have this site, and uh, a lot of the club members do lots of uh, outreach uh, three days a week during 
in season, which is three different seasons of the year. Uh, public nights, it's uh, if you ever want to visit, contact me and I'll and we'll get you up there because uh, pretty cool stuff. Drives me nuts because they have everybody look through the RC, and I've looked through the RC, and I look through the RC, and I say, the view stink. I want to put my camera on this thing. And uh, they have a nice camera, but they do so much uh, outreach that I don't think it sees much camera time, unfortunately. Other types of observatories. The pod is kind of a... Um, it's kind of like a dome, but it's not... And uh, they're pretty popular and they're pretty cool. Um, if you get a pod, you don't have to worry about resale because you take it with you. And uh, on the other hand, you have to have perfectly flat ground. I'd probably suggest either a concrete pad or uh, a wood floor with a concrete pier coming through it. Uh, at, on the right side is a motelescope. Uh, and that represents that the motelescope is pretty cool, uh, but it pretty much just represents having a pier somewhere set up and having it covered. You can get away with a telegizmo cover. I, I considered doing that at one point, but um, then I got my Mach 1 mount and I was really not going to do it with that. I was, I was a bit concerned about due and condensation and uh, all of the things that came with it, but the Motelescope seemed like a cool idea at the time. Um, it does, for I believe it costs around $1,000 and you have to do a lot of work to assemble it. So that's one disadvantage of that. You could probably fabricate something yourself or similar. And uh, third option, the Rubbermaid Observatory. I said before, there are a lot of good options, but uh, a lot of good observatories made from Rubbermaids, but there's no great single plan that I needed to look to to say, well, that's the one I'm going with. You see, in this case, they took the roof right off the side. Um, some people have devised flip tops. Uh, I've seen counterweight things. Um, well, actually, some of the better designs of the Rubbermaids, uh, the Rubbermaid observatories, are where you do what Alex has, and I believe you put the observatory, the entire observatory, on a track, and the entire observatory rolls away from the uh, the the telescope, which could be set up on a tripod for that matter in your driveway, and uh, that's one of the ways that I've seen a Rubbermaid observatory done really effectively because they are so light that. Um, they're kind of easy to push. Uh, so three great, great alternatives to what you would normally think of as uh, the two the two typical observatories. Oh, I love these beautiful old observatories. I wish people were still building stuff like this. And I only put this photo in because uh, I hope to someday like build something that looks like this and have a telescope in it. Of course, to have that kind of disposable income, I don't know how what I'd have to do. Uh, maybe I'll buy some lottery tickets uh, and lose all my money on them. But um, now, in in some countries, these are actually available, and you can renovate them or take them over. So uh, I, I would I would say this one no because this is in good shape. It looks like this has been renovated, but I think uh, th there are some programs like that. I, I, that's what I've heard. Um, I don't think there are any near me, but maybe you'll get lucky. You decide you want to build an observatory. Uh, select your spot, and um, of course, you might choose to build it away from your house. But I, I'm going to say you've chosen the location you're going to build it. On that location, make sure you have a good view of the sky. Place your observatory where you have a good view of the sky. You can always favor a better southern exposure over northern. And why do I say that? The northern sky, everything above Polaris is going to come around. Um, excuse me, everything below Polaris is going to come around. Uh, you might have to wait six months, but it's going to come around. Uh, you, if, if the southern sky, on the other hand, you need good exposure because you're only going to have so much time on certain objects as they're very low in the sky. If you have lots of trees around and you're just trying to cover this top, uh, the, the very top of the sky, then maybe not so much. But you might uh, want to consider getting a chainsaw along with your observatory. Uh, I, I've cut down a few trees. Uh, in your spot, avoid lights that you don't own. Uh, unobstructed view of Polaris. I don't think it's necessary. You can polar align in a number of different ways. You're only going to polar align 
once, and then you're pretty much going to go with it. Maybe six months later, you're going to check it if you're having issues. But unless you're having issues, you're not really going to do it. And most mounts don't require an unobstructed view of Polaris. Um, if you have a polar scope, does it help you get dialed in? I don't know. I have a polar scope that I'd like to get dialed in, but I don't use it so frequently because it's in the observatory. So uh, I had planned to have an unobstructed view of Polaris, and I didn't even think think about it. Uh, to get that unobstructed view, I would have to push my roof farther back than it can go. So uh, would it even make my setup easier? No, not, not the way I set up. So we'll see. Um, if you're setting it up, go outside at night, stand on the spot, use reference soft, uh, excuse me, ref use reference stars and planetarium software. Uh, I, if you're like me, you're going to have specific targets in mind. Uh, I was thinking the Orion Nebula at least. I at least want to be able to see the Orion Nebula to the south. And uh, six months after setting up my observatory, I got that realization that, yes, I can see the Orion Nebula to the south, and I can see it nicely. So uh, that, that kind of uh, made me happy. Uh, just told me I had uh, my planning was right. So you're standing on your spot and you have plans to build. This, is, this gave me pause because we had a different site and it was uh, my parents' summer home and I didn't want to build the observatory at their summer home because I like, I don't know, it just kind of bothered me. So, but I was planning on it and uh, up until I like had really put, given it a lot of thought, I thought this would be a great spot. And I was talking to a builder, and uh, he said, uh, where do you want to build it? And I stood there, and he said, oh, you know, the sprinklers are right near there. And I didn't even think about it. I said, oh, I guess I'll have to move the sprinklers. He said, oh, and you have to be careful because the sewer's nearby too. And I thought, oh, the sewer. I, wouldn't, I didn't even think about that. And uh, the planner was, was already to move the LP gas tank. So I had already checked off all these things. Um, finally, I selected my spot here near my house in town, and uh, I hit bedrock. There's always something. Uh, if it's just dirt, you're going to get lucky, but there's always something. But you always do have to take precautions. Um, I won't talk much about this, but um, if, uh, if you have to get permits and whatnot, uh, they're going to force you to go through a lot of these things to make sure that you're not going to hit those things, depending on, I don't know, I guess depending on your locality, but um, that's pretty much all I'll say on that. Uh, yeah, be so careful. Adam, yeah. with the bedrock, though, you're going to get a much better, a much more stable base for your um, pier or your um, flooring, too, with the bedrock. Yeah. Is. Yes, yes. Bedrock is better than concrete. Uh, one with one uh, difficulty involved, and I'll, I'll kind of get to that because it was the difficulty I ran into. Um, and it'll come in a couple slides, so I'll just uh, I'll get to it eventually. Um, you've decided to build your observatory. You've decided on your site, your spot, your location. Your, you know your ground for the most part. You're gonna have a couple options, and I, I suggest deciding on this now because it's going to determine a lot of other factors. Are you going to decide to go with a concrete or metal pier? And uh, I think both are good options. Um, I could go either way. If I were to do it all over again, I could still go either way. So I'm just going to give you some of the benefits of concrete and metal, the benefits and disadvantages of concrete and metal piers. Uh, concrete is cheap. It's always available locally. It's durable. Uh, you already have it, um, meaning you, you already have used concrete in your project, or you already will be using concrete in your project, most likely, um, because of our local codes and whatnot. I, I was required to use it for some specific reasons. Uh, but um, it's you're already using concrete in your project, most likely. In fact, almost definitely, to pour your metal pier, uh, or excuse me, to, to make your metal pier, you're going to need a concrete footer. So you're already going to be using concrete. So doing the metal is one additional thing on top of that. 
And the, the concrete can also be, can take conduit for cables, uh, which the metal can do as well, but you can put the conduit running right through do so. You can put two conduits if you need to. Um, disadvantages rem removal involves demolition. Uh, you might not need an excavator, but uh, for my PRU, if they wanted to get rid of the entire thing, they're going to need a major excavator because I overdid it. Uh, actually, my, my footer to it. My, my pier might come out relatively easily, uh, but that's another story. Uh, the disadvantage of the pier, though, I, I said you already get, you already have the concrete, but it may require two pours. Um, depending on who you ask, someone uh, when you're pouring your pier, you've got a footer and a pier. The footer is below the sonotube pier, so to speak, and sonotube is a good form to use for a pier, although you could use wood just the same. But your your footer below it has to fill up with concrete, and then your sonotube would go on top of that. So some people would argue that as you start filling the uh, uh, footer, it starts to set enough that you could fill the sonotube as you're going, and the sonotube won't fill up and overflow the footer. It'll hold itself in. Well, that depends on a lot of stuff, and you can pr you'll find a lot of astronomers who will argue that point, and you won't find a concrete guy out there that will do it. So I had to take the concrete guy's advice on this one, and I do it, and I did it in two pours, and I, I think that was a good that was good advice. Um, but it does require two pours. That means that you're going to have to have rebar going between the two pours, and I suggest strong rebar. You'll see in my regrets that I didn't use strong enough rebar, and if I uh, push or really rack on my pier enough, I can get some vibration going, and it bothers me. Uh, I don't think it ever causes an issue, but every issue I have, I blame the 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 rebar in my in my uh, thing, uh, as well as one other thing that I'll mention. Uh, but for a concrete pier, you will need a pier plate. Uh, that can either either involve a dance pier plate, which is the the absolute best way to go. They're just beautiful pier plates, but they're also really expensive. Or it can involve a local metal shop that'll drill out some holes and uh, set you up pretty nicely. Um, either way is a good way. Just kind of depends on what you're looking to get out of it. With, a me with metal piers, you're going to have to order them. They're going to come flatbed or some sort of, um, some sort of truck. Uh, they are expensive. Uh, if you go with a dance pier plate, you've almost approached the price of a metal pier. But if you go with concrete and your local metal worker, uh, metal piers are going to be more expensive. You have to anticipate the lead time, which might be three weeks to eight weeks or something like that. Um, just depends on where it comes from, uh, whether they're pre-made or whether you have to custom order them, whether you have to custom order them to your specific height. Uh, all things to keep in mind. And then when you're building something and you're trying to schedule contractors, uh, if that's what you're doing, that's one thing you really... You're probably waiting on your metal pier. That's probably what you're waiting on. Unless you're on the astrophysics refractor list and you're waiting on that. Um, the metal piers still need to be mounted to a concrete footer, which has to be level, which has to be pour, uh, created with a template. So it's no more difficult than pouring a concrete pier, but a lot of the same steps. Uh, metal piers do have are, are typically well opened up, so through the pier cabling works a lot better. Some of them even have it even have outlet receptors, which is pretty convenient. Um, or for a metal pier, you can go to your local welder. There's some designs floating around on cloudy nights uh, for some pretty smart metal piers that actually would probably work better than any of the commercial designs out there, and uh, you could have a local welder do for reasonably price a reasonable price. Pier height. I almost didn't put this slide in here because I can give you very little information on what height your pier should be. It depends on your wall height, your distance to the wall, your mount type, pretty much the distance between your mount's axis, your uh, ro rotational axis, and the uh, um, rotational axis kind of when it's parked and uh, the uh, spot that it attaches to the pier. Uh, that, of course, depends on your mount. The radius of your telescope when parked, and why do I say that? And, oh, that's okay. 
Uh, why do I say that? Because you can choose to design your pier or a uh, pier to be high enough or walls to be low enough that you get the maximum, maximum, maximum exposure. So you can park your telescope and the roof barely hits it, but once you lift your telescope slightly out, you can see, if you have no trees on the horizon, you can see horizon to horizon. If you're on a mountaintop, you can see everything. You won't miss a target because of uh, your walls. Um, that said, if you want to close your roof and your telescope isn't parked, you better be careful. And that's why what I prefer to do and what I did is, um, and I allowed myself even more leeway because I had tall trees around me and I wasn't really chasing any low horizons. That, that wasn't an option for me. Uh, but I think the height of the telescope pointed manually towards Polaris is the better way to go. Uh, if you have a dew, uh, dew cap on it, you take that into account. And uh, what that means is you've shut down for the night, you forgot to park your telescope and you're closing the roof. You don't chop the top of your telescope off. You, it's a safety precaution. Uh, keep, your, keep it safe because you could, really, uh, you could really be stupid when you're tired at night. I've done a lot of stupid things just tired at night. And uh, by building it smart, I didn't have to be smart later on. All depends on your horizons. When all is said and done with your pier height, subtract your pier plate and the bolts that extend onto it from your desired concrete pier height uh, because uh, that pier plate can add a lot. My pier build. So I started digging and uh, on the left there, actually have there been any questions yet, as of yet? No, nothing yet. Thanks, Robert. Um, my peer build, I hit re, or excuse me, I hit bedrock right off the bat, and I knew it was trouble. And um, I could have gotten away with a much, much lower footer, but uh, I kind of anticipated that um, if I had just put that sono tube into that bedrock, then it would have been a, uh, about a ten foot high sono tube, and that would have tipped right over. So I needed some sort of footer. And if that didn't work, then I wanted some sort of base to be able to put a metal pier on. So I built that giant form, 36 inches by 36 inches by 36 inches, and uh, basically put some rebar inside of it. The rebar does no next to nothing for it except keeps it from sliding off the ground. Uh, the rebar was drilled into the ground. I bought a... Um, a hammer drill or a, a rock hammer or some, I forget what it's called, from uh, Harbor Freight for $80. And I drilled those holes out and I had planned on selling it, but I kind of like the thing. It, it looks like, uh, I don't know, it looks like a weapon, so it was pretty, it's pretty fun. Uh, I'll wait for the next zombie apocalypse to use it. But uh, meanwhile, uh, so I have my rebar coming out of the ground. That's epoxied into the ground. And uh, rebar coming out of the top. And then later on, after I built my building, after I built my observatory, after I had my walls up, I actually brought my telescope into the building and set it up on my tripod and saw what I, depend, based on the wall height, how it was going to look. Then I poured my final pour. And it actually turned out really well. Uh, I had a plan to use the kind of stupid. I had a plan to use a, a drill to mix my concrete because I saw it done on the internet. They made it look easy and it didn't work. So my uh, pores were a little bit inconsistent because I was trying the drill and then I was going back to just using a shovel in the bucket and that always bothered me. I, I would have loved a nice smooth pour but uh, between that and using underweight rebar, those are my two biggest regrets and it really takes a rack to, to, to shake it. So I, it's not a big concern, but uh, it's one of those things that uh, if, I hadn't, uh, if I had done it better, it wouldn't be bothering me. Over gravel, or dirt for that matter, reaches thermal equilibrium quickly, easy to build. You don't need a concrete truck. You might have already had your concrete truck coming out, but if you're doing bags, um, you don't want to do a floor. That takes up too much space. I didn't want to do bags of concrete. 
back when I thought I had to go down 36 inches. I ended up hitting bedrock. Should have been lucky, but I had to bring it up seven feet, eight feet. Um, wood over gravel, though, disadvantages are bugs and rot. Um, it's going to take a while for that to take effect, at least the rot. Uh, bugs, you're going to get bugs either way. Uh, I suggest using pesticides, and we're all going to probably use pesticides, lots and lots of them. Uh, uh, the perimeter stuff is pretty good because that way you don't have to get it so close to you. You pretty much spray everything underneath and then you're set. Uh, concrete. Um, you're going to need a concrete truck, and I was not comfortable doing a concrete floor myself, so uh, I would have needed a mason. Um, you can mess up concrete quickly and can't fix it quickly, uh, but it's very durable. If it's a commercial observatory, you're going to do concrete. No, no other way around it. Um, you don't want people tripping on wood or anything like that. It's completely rotten, animal resistant, which is a good thing about it. Uh, you go on cloudy nights and they say concrete holds a lot of thermal inertia. So it holds the heat and the temperature and it slowly releases it through the night. So it gives you kind of a, a negative boundary layer, which isn't a good thing. Uh, to overcome that, um, and, and they make a, a lot of people make a big deal about this, but I think to overcome that you could... Uh, Insulate it some way. Put a foam uh, foam floor over it if you, if you had to. Uh, but um, you could point a fan at it. You could put cooled pipes below it. I guess it depends on how crazy you are and how uh, OC you are. But I'd be pretty happy if I had a concrete floor. I wouldn't be worrying so much about the thermal inertia. Our club has concrete floors in both of their observatories. I don't think the university would want to be concerned with getting sued because they had a wood floor. So. I think that's just the way it works. But demolition is required to remove it. Uh, so it's going to be there. Keep that in mind. My floor, uh, I took a lot of pictures as I went. So uh, you're going to get to see a lot of this stuff. Uh, you see some of the bushes I had to cut out. Um, I basically uh, cut down. I, I, I always had these overgrown bushes that I hated, and I didn't have a a really a good excuse to cut them out, and then I said, "I'm building an observatory." It was that, mo uh, it was that quick of a decision, and I started chopping them down, and I started digging, and dug my footers, built everything, and at this point, I had gotten up to my floor. I have that sino tube sitting there just to kind of help me envision it, but uh, at this point, uh, I could have probably brought my telescope out there and set my tripod up and started using it, but I committed to not using my telescope while I was building the observatory. And that was the best thing I could do because I was in a hurry to build the observatory and get it done so I could use it. Had I thrown my telescope up there, I might have gotten lazy and stopped and had a half-built observatory. And that was my biggest concern. Even getting stuck on a technical issue, uh, which fortunately didn't happen. And I'm going right to the, roll, to the roof because the walls are pretty much walls, um, studded walls. You can look it up. Uh, using whether they're interior or exterior walls, it's pretty similar. Um, I did 16-inch center over center walls, but uh, you actually don't have to, if you're building more of a shed, you don't have to do that. Um, I was kind of OC about it, but I did. Um, but for your roof, uh, if you're doing a roll-off roof, V-groove caster, casters and inverted angle iron. Um, you can get the V-groove casters online. I think I bought mine from Caster City for a really expensive amount of money only to have the same ones pop up on Amazon a few weeks later for a lot cheaper. So shop around. Um, you don't have to have the best casters as long as they can hold the, the weight they're determined. I used six on each side, which meant that the weight was almost minimal. They could take These could take probably 2,000 pounds a piece, and uh, my roof probably weighs 2,000 pounds. So... Not a concern. On the right side there, you're going to see the angle iron, and that's spot welded to um, just a piece of flat iron stock. 20 feet long was mine for a 10 by 8 by 10 observatory. Actually, it's 9 by 10, I believe. Pushed it out after I planned it just a little bit because they always say go bigger. Put I had them drill holes in it so I could hammer it down. Uh, I did not slot the holes. That's a concern of mine. Uh, I probably should have slotted the holes because that metal is going to expand. And uh, I could probably calculate how much that metal expands, but if it starts popping those nails, I'm going to have a concern. 
And I do have a scaffold set up at my observatory right now just so I could do some other uh, maintenance stuff. So if you saw the video that I posted, you'll see the scaffold set up. That's the reasoning for it. This is another view of the angle iron spot welded to that flat stock. And on the right side here, you can see the... Uh, this is what I call the initial rail of the roof. Uh, this is going to become the side that rolls. And I had to make sure that the lumber was straight. I actually put more spacers in there to make it uh, more sturdy. But I used bolts going through the axles of the casters. Uh, I, think that I, I, I think that the casters actually came with their own axles. And I don't have access to the grease bearings on them, which concerns me a little bit. But I also think that I could probably take them off one at a time if I had to. So, uh, and leave the others remaining. So I could probably get in there if I had to. Um, so after that, uh, this, is, this is one of the spots that I'm kind of proud of. Uh, you see those posts, those supports in the rear of the observatory. Those are 12 feet tall. I cut them down from 16 feet. They're actually 12 foot 6. So I cut them down from 16 feet, uh, 16 foot 6 by 6s. And I, uh, every, every step of the way, I found myself ahead of schedule building the observatory. So I had some guys scheduled to come over on a Monday to help me do this. And I was all caught up on Friday. And I was thinking to myself, I don't want to wait till Monday. It had just rained, and these things were really heavy. Uh, I think I calculated them to weigh like 220 pounds a piece, but you had to stand them up straight. So I drafted my wife and I made her help me stand them up. And she hates me over it. She still brings it up. But the two of us got them standing and got them nailed in, standing vertically. And I, in a hurry, hurried all those rear supports in. But that was probably the proudest uh, point uh, of building my observatory, getting her involved and uh, really struggling to do something. Uh, she, she refused to help me with the keystone that goes across the top of those two. I did that myself, but I just kept nailing a board up and went back and forth and back and forth until it was up to the top. So up until this point, I had done pretty, I had previously done a lot of this stuff. I, I framed out walls. I've done a lot of interior walls. I've screwed down floors and plywood and stuff like that. I'd never built a roof before. I've, I've had no idea how to build a roof. So I did a lot of Googling. And I'll tell you, I probably Googled and watched the same videos for a week just learning how to build a roof. And you know how long it took me to build that thing? About four hours. So I was so intimidated. I was so overwhelmed. And I got it done in literally no time. And when I say about well, four hours, I got it all framed out. Um, it took me a lot longer to get the, the plywood up top, or excuse me, the uh, I think I used OSB up top, but um, I was uh, it, it just one of those spots where I was so intimidated I couldn't start, and then when I finally started, I just got it done in no time at all. But before you even get to this point, make sure your rollers roll nicely, because this is the point of no return. It's going to get heavier and heavier and heavier from now on. You do not want to have to take it off. Uh, I had considered building it off and then putting it up there. I'm glad I did not go that way because that's not something you want to do. Before I know it, um, siding goes up quickly. Even metal roofs are really easy to put on. Uh, all of the edging fixes any errors you may make. Before you know it, you're finished. Um, other considerations for inside of the observatory, power outlets, USB, Ethernet. You want them exactly where you want them. Know where your desk's going to be and put it there. Lighting. You need to have lighting because you're going to be out there at night. You're going to lose something. You need to be able to flip on a real light. Don't think it's an observatory. I won't need a light. The other consideration about lighting is it doesn't go in the ceiling. It goes on the wall. So you might need one on both sides. You might want a red light in there too. But that's something just to keep in mind. Computer desk, you're pretty much going to need it. If it's on wheels... Uh, it may be a little bit better so you could wheel it towards you up here if you're trying to do something back and forth. A warm room, uh, if it's not at your house and it's elsewhere, you have to drive there, you might want a warm room. Climate control to prevent heat buildup. If you're in some hot climate and that room is going to get to be 104 to 100, 150 degrees, it's bad for the equipment, then consider that. 
If you're in Pennsylvania, you don't have to worry about it at all. Um, in fact, the best climate control, I think, is a vent and have it meant to be the same temperature as the outside, if possible. Still going to heat up a little bit, but if possible. Motorized roof, it's great to have a motorized roof if you can. One button push and it opens up. Um, not that opening a roof is difficult, but if you cannot do it in the middle of the winter and do everything from inside, it's that much better. An IP camera. I have an IP camera, and it pretty much shows me when the mount is getting close to hitting the pier. Uh, if it's not where it's supposed to be, um, if somebody's in there, uh, I can see it from farther away. It'll send me an email if a specific alarm goes off. So uh, even if my kids are in there, it, it could I could have it warn me. Good locks on your observatory. Are people going to steal your telescope? I always wonder that. I don't think so, but I'm not going to take the risk. But I, I, I think they'd come in, they'd want your TV, they'd want your this, they'd want your that. They'd look at your telescope, they wouldn't be able to figure out how to get it off. They, they, they may break it. That's more of a concern than actually theft, I think. Um, but good locks, because you don't want to be concerned with breakage or theft. PC to control everything. Keep a PC in the observatory, control it from in your house with remote desktop, or type VNC or splash top or whatever method you use, but that's uh, what a lot of us are doing. And uh, that way you don't have latency issues. Your PC in the observatory is doing all the work. Everything in between is just being run by a simple uh, program that just shows you the, what's going on on that computer. Hey, Adam, before you go further, um, there's yes. a question. Is there anything keeping the roof secured to the structure other than the roof? Yes. Um, I don't think I have it photographed. I actually have just simple eye hooks. Well, they're, they're not simple eye hooks. They're kind of oversized eye hooks that I latch down when I know I'm not using it and when there may be um, weather coming through. Um, they, you, you, there are a lot of different latch methods, and you're pretty much going to be looking at gate latches and... Uh, you also have to devise kind of uh, another method. First of all, if you have over, uh, you can have overlapping um, L brackets, and if you angle them in a certain way, when you close the roof, it'll kind of lock itself in place. So that way, if you have an updraft, it will prevent it from blowing the roof. At the same time, um, you can do a latch method where you can manually latch it shut. If you're concerned with, it, it all depends on where you live. If you're concerned with 40 mile an hour winds and 50 mile an hour winds, then there's one method. If you're concerned with hurricanes, another method. Tornadoes, another method. And where I live, we don't really have that big of an issue. I have trees all around, so I just have the eye hooks. I probably have to deal with it minimally. Even our local area isn't rated for updraft. I think it's called updraft in roofs as strong as a lot of the other places are. But that's that's about the the best I could do, and um, you'll even if you are building an observatory, ask that specific question on cloudy nights because you'll get specific advice to uh, where you live. The, the um, other thing, Adam, is um, check with your local contractor too, because I live up in New York, and there's a snow load bearing that you have to take in consideration being up in the north um, for the pitch of your roof that you have to have and then possibly the material that you might have to have um, in regards to that. So I have to use OSB and I have um, shingles on mine. So I don't tie mine down because mine's heavy enough that I've had 60 mile an hour winds here and it hasn't moved. But yeah, check with I, your local, contra or local um, inspectors. Yeah, I was reluctant to bring up any of that just because everybody's codes are different and if I say you only need to have this. That only applies to me where I live. Every place has different load, uh, roof load bearings for snow and wind bear. It just totally depends on where you live. So your your local contractors and even um, your local um, uh, you go onto your local uh, inspections. I, I forget the name of the website, but it'll tell you where to look. They a lot of them de in the basic stuff, defer to other areas. But if 
you're not technical and you have to, your contractors know this stuff already. So, contractor or your, or your um, local building inspector. That's building really inspector, good. yeah. Um, so, uh, things I do differently. Roll off roof tracks should tilt away from the building. And when I say tilt away from the building, I mean ever, ever, ever so slightly. Um, my, there's probably about a, a half inch difference between the furthest rear track to the front, but it does tilt towards my building and water does run down the track. And since I'm spot welded and you pretty much, that track, I didn't mention this, I only mentioned spot welding, I didn't say why you're not welding it the entire run. Uh, as they weld it the entire run, it has a tendency to warp the track and the the welder wouldn't do it for me. He said it was it's just gonna make it into like kind of a, a big bend. So he suggested spot welding it and uh, that's that's the way I went. Now maybe there's another method but that's the reason I went that way. And because of that water can get inside of it. I've since sealed it up. I've since um, done a few other things but for some reason the water still gets in. I have a can of flex seal and that seems to have fixed it except for one spot. Um, I might have gone with a little bit lighter weight of a roof, and I don't even know how to achieve that, but uh, my roof is just a little bit heavy. Um, I'm going to motorize it, and as you see below, I should have motorized it from the start, but uh, I didn't, and I'm kind of uh, regretting it. Not that I really have trouble mo opening the roof, but it's just a, an inconvenience. When there's lots of snow out there, it is, ha it is impossible to move the roof, and that's something I have to address. Uh, we had two and a half feet of snow on it last year, and that was very, very difficult. And especially when you get a clear night in the middle of the winter after all that snow, uh, you want an image, and you can't get your roof open, so that drives you nuts. Better peer pour. I already mentioned that I did it inconsistently. Uh, I wish I had concentrated on that more. To be honest, I don't even remember the day that I poured the peer. I just remember failing with the drill, being really mad, and mixing lots of concrete and dumping it in there which uh, uh, somehow I managed to get the template right and the, the pier plate on there straight and everything. Uh, support placement. Um, you'll notice that I have an overhang on my observatory. And I didn't plan on doing that, but I decided to push out the rear a little bit at the last minute. And uh, late design change. Probably should have anticipated it, but I didn't. It's pretty, pretty much the things I do differently. Things I did right. V-groove, casters, and angle iron, definite way to go. Wire routing, I had, lo I had lots of conduit. I did that well. I had enough electrical outlets. I'm not going to regret not putting up. I like my wall height. I have a high wall height, which allows me to have a standard height doorway. The wall height, since I'm not dealing with horizons because I have trees all around me, um, prevents the wind from really messing anything up. Gives me a little bit more protection. Um, Ventilation, I left it very, very open. I actually don't have, um, uh, it's pretty much open air underneath, so air gets in and gets out. It's not very well sealed, and I kind of like that. I might seal it a little bit better if I see little flakes of snow inside, but I haven't yet. I did notice some leaves in there, which got me concerned. I don't know how the leaves got in there. If they blew in, that's a concern of mine, but I want to make sure that's exactly what's happening. Things I did right, I'm happy with the size of it. I didn't need two telescopes in there. I'm barely ever out in there. I'm usually controlling it from my kitchen, so happy with that. Um, location, I put it in the perfect spot in my yard to get the targets that I wanted. And you'll notice that it's uh, positioned on a hill, and the rear of it is four feet above the ground, and the front of it is even with my driveway. So it's kind of floating above ground, which also is good for the thermals. It gets the floor cool. So that I really did right. Uh, mistakes to avoid, and these are things that if people have made them already, I, I apologize, I'm not calling you out on it, but there, I've seen it done and I've seen people regret it. The roof, uh, a roll-off roof should slide along the ridge axis. So that center ridge, that's the way the roof should slide. If it slides along the other axis, and there's dew or snow on it, then all that snow can fall into your observatory. In fact, it probably will once it starts vibrating, like when you're opening it. 
And that's one thing I, I see observatories built that way, and I just I, I cringe knowing the snow that I get uh, here. So uh, that's one thing to consider. Avoid the rat cage pier. If you don't know about the rat cage pier, Google it. You'll see it. Don't worry if you find you have a rat cage pier because an easy fix exists. A rat cage pier is basically a pier that has four bolts on the four corners and nothing more. So that top kind of wobbles on it. And it leaves you a nice space to put um, a power supply uh, or lots of different stuff, a, U a USB port, lots of cool stuff in there. But they also say it induces vibration. I, it might be over, uh, it might be overrated, uh, over exaggerated. But um, there, there, there's also some uh, uh, some good logic behind it. But don't worry, easy fixes exist. If you have, if you find you have a rat cage pier, you can have a piece of a uh, circular metal pipe cut and you can fit it right in there and tighten down those bolts and then you've just eliminated your rat cage. Rat cage. It's not, it's just well distributed, not on those four points. Um, I put this under mistakes to avoid use pressure treated. I, I probably should have said don't use, I don't know, but you should use pressure treated plywood for your floor. Um, I My floor is exposed uh, but uh, is, is is exposed on the bottom and the top, so they'd probably say use pressure treated, but let's say for one reason or another it's not. But the dew is constantly going to be hitting your floor, and I think in that event it's just going to rot away any floor that's under it, so the pressure treated is going to give you that much more protection. Another, I'm going to repeat it, don't give up your southern views for your northern view. When you're positioning your observatory, get the most out of your southern views, because the northern views are going to come around. Now, I'm not saying park it under a tree so that you can get great northern views, though I've been guilty of doing that on the run sometimes, but um, don't, uh, just don't give them up. Don't give up southern views. They're the important ones. Off-site remote, remote automation is different. And why is it different? because you have to do a much better job with your observatory. You have to do a much better job building it and planning it and automating it. And the reason for that is when something goes wrong at 3 a.m., it's either a drive or a plane flight or lots of things that, that you may not want to do. So you have to fix all those issues before they occur. And you just have to think about all the things that go into it. You have to be able to turn on and off any devices. You have to be able to control your motorized roof and know when your motorized roof is controlled. You also have to know if it hasn't closed properly. The roof has to know when your telescope's pointed up so that it doesn't close on your telescope. You have to have a cloud sensor to override everything, to tell you it's getting cloudy. Oh, here comes some rain. Close the roof. So a lot of stuff has to go into it. Focuser, you have to be able to focus. You can't go out there to focus. You have to be able to take your lens cap off. They have methods for doing this, but every single one of these is going to cost you money. And when I was considering doing an off-site remote observatory, I realized that I didn't want to spend that money. Even flats. Well, actually, flats get easy. You do sky flats when you're off-site remote. That is not going to cost you any more money. But you could do a flip flat, and that covers your lens cap. So maybe you'd be tempted to do that for five, six, seven hundred dollars But you see where I'm getting the difference between an observatory and an automated remote observatory could be uh, nine to ten thousand dollars. You really have to have a bulletproof system when you're off-site remote, and uh, that's uh, a certainty. If if you if you take a chance, you're going to regret it later. You're set. Then you pretty much set everything up and you use it. Um, this is my mount set up in my observatory with the roof slid back. I've since put walls on. Um, I wasn't in a rush to put on walls, but now my kids are old enough that they grab those wires and I shouldn't have those wires exposed. Oh yeah, don't forget your logo. You have to get yourself a logo for your observatory so you can print t-shirts and beer cozies for your friends. That's the most important part. And uh, my, my observatory is the Loose Rooster Observatory. Quickly, the first few days that I was building my observatory, I uh, heard a rooster out in the woods. And um, my parents actually have chickens and roosters. And I thought, they're the only crazy people that have chickens and roosters around here. And 
I called them up and I said, hey, your chickens or roosters are loose in the woods. And they're like, no, they're not. And I'm like, no, yes, they are. <laughs> and they said, no, they're not. So I chase down this rooster and I photograph it and I send the photograph to my mom. She says, that's not my rooster. And I, I swear she's lying to me. I'm like ready to throw a garbage bucket over the thing and bring it back to their chicken coop. And it turns out it was our across the street neighbor's rooster. And I spent the first day that I was doing my digging chasing a rooster thinking it was my parents. So I decided to uh, name the uh, observatory after the loose rooster who a few days later lost his life to a bird dog. Um, so uh, this is all that's left of him. But uh, that's how my observatory got its name for those who are curious. How. It would also make a great name for a beer, which is why I put the uh, beer cozy over there. And that's it. So that's the end of my presentation. going to jump back here. There's no quite no new questions right now. No new questions. Yeah, and I see. Uh, I just see the comments lighting up here. So I was kind of separated from all of this stuff. But yeah, no observatory. I see the first one. I see no observatory. No observatory equals bumping a tripod and losing polar alignment. Yeah, that's the best thing. I I even forgot about that. How many times I used to do that? Uh, you just get finished and then you're walking away. And worse than doing that is. Bumping your tripod and not knowing whether you lost your polar alignment. <laughs> so, do I polar align myself all over again? Or did I not bump it that hard? That's, that's what keeps me up at night. <laughs> I got an uh, um, observation. Because I do the angle iron with the um, roller casters also. Mm -hmm. And, um, of course, being up a little further north than you, um, get a good snow off Lake Erie. Um, I also have that same issue of, you know, how do I open up the observatory? It, it ices up. I saw your video that you have. What I did is I took um, pipe heaters that you can buy at Lowe's or whatever, and I ran them underneath. I just used like sponge pieces of sponges to keep keep the heater up on top of the um, to the top of the uh, metal, and I just plugged them in, you know, in the afternoon when I know it's going to be a clear night, and just let that heat, you know, it's a slow heat and it melts all the ice off and and then just use a uh, roof rake to rake off any of the uh, snow. And I have no issues then. And that's, is the, that's under, okay, so you're, uh, are your angle irons mounted on a flat piece of stock or no? No, I have it actually, I have three four foot sections of angle irons. So if I need to, I can take them out and, and fix, you know, uh, yeah. and adjust what I need to adjust. But I use the um, foam. Um, underneath uh, the angle iron so that way it holds the uh, heater in place. Yeah, and the heater is like a wire, right? Um, yeah, it's, it's a coated wire that you'd use for um, like people that don't have uh, basements or just crawl spaces. They have to have the heater wrap around uh, the pipe so they don't burst. Yeah, yeah, I was looking into something like that and that, that's probably going to be my best bet. It is about 14 feet off the ground so I have the scaffold out there, and it's like it's tough to plan for the winter with that. But uh, that's kind of my thinking. I'm gonna have to put some sort of heat tape under there or something like that, because it does ice up as well as snow up. So that prevents my roof from just moving. I've got a couple questions. Go ahead. Um. The interface between your floor and your pier. Um, I'm thinking if you, you know, are walking on the floor. Um, although you operate from the kitchen, I believe. Um, but if you're walking on the floor, it's going to vibrate your pier. Actually, um, I, I was going to bring that up. The first of all, with my setup, so I have a wood floor and a concrete pier. It mine is completely isolated. I have a circle going right around my concrete pier and there's nowhere that the concrete pier touches the wood floor. When you, if you do a concrete floor, then they suggest putting um, actually foam between the, uh, between the pour for the pier and the floor and you can actually dissolve the foam after the fact. 
but in all cases they they say isolate the peer from the floor just in case. Right. Um, can your leaves be blowing up through that floor? I don't think so. There's there's not much space. Okay. Um, it's more <laughs> likely I trampled them in coming in through the doorway. No. But uh, but I don't I don't remember doing that. Actually, the reason that I I found leaves in there in the spring, and uh, that's what that's what kind of made me curious because I thought I had cleaned it out in the winter. I didn't really expect to see many leaves in there, but um, I'll I'll figure it out one of these times. Okay, I've got more questions. Go ahead. Um, peer height, um, finished peer height. Um, do you just kind of set your tripod out there and say, okay, this is where it's going to be, um, or have you? I, I mean, if you're operating without, you know, um, not for photography, your peer height wouldn't have to be all that high. Um, unless you just say, okay, I'm going to make it so that it's convenient for uh, visual observing too. Yeah, if you're not if you're not observing visually, then you just completely ignore what's comfortable. You you want to be able to put the telescope on the pier comfortably, but um, I liked having higher walls, and I did not have to concern myself with horizons. That th that makes my situation a little bit different than others. If you have great horizons, if you can see all the way down, or you're on a mountaintop or something like that, you can see everywhere around you, then you're going to want your peer height, and you're an imager, you're going to want your peer height pretty high relative to your walls. You're going to want your um, you're going to want your peer height such that uh, your tele your your telescope's axis plus the radius of the telescope, half of the diameter of the telescope, is um, going to almost touch the roof. So that as soon as you lift it out, that's pretty much going to be your best angle at, or a good angle at everything. But there, there's, I really spent a lot of time on pier height when I was doing mine, and because of my trees, it was really, it didn't matter. Okay, last one. Um, observatory PC. You mentioned good to have the PC out there and then operate the PC remotely. That sounds good, except around here, uh, temperatures get down to. It's not not unusual to get down 20 below in January. I'm not sure if the PC is going to like that very much sitting out there. Um, and then if I want to start her up, uh, I'm thinking I might have to bring a laptop out too. The observatory to use it, and even at that, um, PC's not going to work right out there. Um, in my experience, in my experience, the screen stops working. Yeah, but you don't really need the screen if you're operating it from inside. But sure. um, I wouldn't buy an expensive PC to go out there. In fact, I use a laptop, but I think a desktop might be a little bit better. And um, you might not need to use a fan in it. There, there are things you can do just to keep the PC a little bit warmer. Um, I, I don't know. I have so many PC parts in my house that I don't really concern myself with desktops and whatnot because I can throw, I could probably throw three or four computers together with just spare parts. But uh, not that I have enough monitors to run them. But um, it, it takes so such a such little processing power to and RAM to really run a, a, a session that um, you don't need much of a computer. So I, I've seen people where they've gone and used um, like light bulbs, heat bulbs almost in their PCs. I've seen people use um, uh, like the heating pads on timers um, so that way it starts warming up if they know it's going to be warm or going to be clear. Um, and then uh, in regards to the uh, um, LCD, the, that's what's going to uh, not show up, is you can somehow put like a heating pad on the back of that too, so, but. Okay. Any other questions? I'm, I just see a few popping up. I have to switch over here. I want to see what these questions are. Hey, 
Hey, how expensive was it for you guys to get the the rebar? I mean, I mean, not the rebar, the um, the angle iron, uh, and have the holes drilled, or in your case, Adam, have it welded to that flat piece. Was that very expensive? I think it was three hundred dollars, and um, so for two twenty twenty foot pieces of angle iron welded to flat iron. Is that right? Yep, I called a recycling center and I asked if they had angle iron and flat stock and they said, of course we do. And then I asked if they could weld it and they said, oh yeah, but we'll have to charge you for that. And it was like $300. Now I live in Scranton, so maybe it's cheaper here than some other places. Um, but I don't know, I was kind of surprised about that. Funny story with my concrete. Uh, I found a really good concrete guy to do my concrete and he stood me up for my first meeting with him. He stood me up for my second meeting with him. Uh, then when we were supposed to do the project, he stood me up two weekends in a row. So I pretty much said, all right, get out of here. I'm not giving you the job after this. And I called up a guy the next day. And Oh, so first of all, this guy wanted to charge me $1,500, which I thought was a little bit more expensive than I was expecting, but I can understand it. He was going to do it for me. He told me to stop working. He was going to do everything for me. That sounded great. Uh, so stood me up a bunch of times, never showed up. I said, forget about that. Called another guy. He wanted to come the next day, had the concrete truck scheduled, came, did it, charged me $300, and was gone. And, like, it's funny how uh, if you call the right person, you get a great price. So especially with, like, welded metal, someone's going to be cheap, so it's worth, uh, worth checking on. And that's not something you can do out of aluminum, right? Like, it's not strong enough. I wouldn't do it out of aluminum, no. First of all, it'll be ridiculously expensive, I think. I think I think aluminum stock like that is really expensive. I may be wrong, but... And I don't think aluminum stock like that would actually come in... Well, at least it's not easy to find in 20-foot pieces like that. Not only that, you would need a lot thicker pieces, too, because of the... And it's a lot softer metal, too, so it would end up eventually wearing out on you. You know, one thing I didn't do, but it's pro I'd probably recommend, uh, sand it and use, like, Rust-Oleum or something on it. Um, not because you don't want it to rust, because it's probably going to rust anyway, but if it does get dewy and the dew drips down, it and that always drove me nuts, just the stains on my interior wood. Now you don't see it anymore because I put my walls up recently, but if, if you care about it, looking pretty. You know how you were talking about doing the um, flooring, possibly rotting? Um, one of the things I did is I sealed mine, um, and then I also put a indoor-outdoor carpeting over top of it. But the uh, first thing I did was I sealed my inside walls, and I sealed the floor. So that way, um, like the uh, Minwax sealer or whatever it is, um, I painted them black. And then I did an indoor-outdoor carpeting um, on the inside because I got a 10 by uh, 8 spot I can walk around uh, for my in my observatory up top. I'm considering carpet tiles. I'm just I, I'm thinking about them. I, I've seen a few waterproof carpet tiles. I want to keep it really cheap because if I don't like it I want to be able to rip it out but that's kind of what I'm what I'm leaning towards. And it might happen might happen soon, might not. It really doesn't bother me. It's all aesthetics in the observatory at this point and who cares about that? Exactly. exactly. And the thing with mine is I can just throw the vacuum in there real easy. It's it's real simple. Um, if it you know indoor outdoor carpeting, it's not a big deal. I can replace that pretty cheap. Um, one of the I was looking at doing um, different types of piers also. You know whether it be metal or do the sonitu. And because of the way mine is built, it would have had to have been like an eight foot tall pier. And um, what I ended up using was the 16 by 16 inch by 8 inch high chimney block. Mm -hmm. And I cemented them all on, and all I did was, because um, I've heard people use uh, sand in it to help dampen it, but I have no issues with it. I just put a uh, metal plate up on top, and then I put my pier adapter on top of that. Um, and I've had no issues with that. And like as you said, put the uh, little spacer around it from the flooring so that way there's no nothing touching it. Yeah, a lot of people have luck with the chimney blocks, especially for, for high piers. And it's good to get your observatory off the ground 
that's actually uh, really beneficial uh, just for the seeing. So. So those chimney blocks were they just mortared together? Yeah, let me put a post uh, two uh, pictures in the uh, comment or chat section there, because the very first chimney block I actually um, cemented. Ah, oh, Schneikies is not going to show up the right way. Because um, if you go uh, if you go to my website here and go under observatory, um, you'll see and scroll down the pictures there. You'll see my construction. You know, as I was going through my construction. Um, my first chimney block I cemented right in halfway into my uh, pier base and then I just uh, started cementing them you know normal chimney block you know just the typical and then I would once in a while put a, a rebar down through the middle not through the middle through the sides because they got the holes in them and fill them in a little bit with concrete then too for added support. And what I did is I did, I did a, I guess you would say a lot different style. I went with a, a pole barn style um, uh, building. Uh, and a recommendation I found out the hard way is that mice love that spray foam stuff. So huh. don't use that. Use steel wool for any little gaps that you have. Use steel wool, stuff it in there, use a screwdriver because they don't like chewing on the steel wool. So and I had quite a few gaps using the pole barn style, um, but I saved a, a lot on lumber I think, for the for the size of shed or not shed, but uh, um, observatory I had, which happened to be a ten by sixteen. You're in Buffalo, New York. That's yeah. Fro what's your frost depth? Uh, I had to go three feet or thirty or forty eight inches for all my holes, um, and um, my pier base I want. Um, three foot by three foot because it's 32 inches I do believe for the frost. Oh no no no. Yeah it's 36 right. inches for the depth and I want 44 inches deep. Yeah. Yeah because I think we're close to 32 inches here but I guess our I guess we're pretty close but you guys just get lots of snow. Yeah coming off the lake there. Yeah. 32 inches. You guys are lucky. Minnesota's 80 to 90, or up to 100 if you go to northern Minnesota. So I'll take 32. I'll trade you guys any day of the week. Yeah. Not to one-up you. But uh, I do have a question. So regarding the, uh, the snow on the observatory roof, is it at all just possible to heat the roof just to keep the snow off of it and prevent ice from building up? Oh, yeah, you could. <clears throat> Because what you could do is, you know how you got those gutter, those little gutter things that you, you a lot of people put above their gutters to keep the ice from forming? Mm -hmm. um, you can either put that um, on the inside, touching your roof, or you could probably just run that along on the top of your roof, too. Yeah, because one of the things I'm worried about is ice damming, especially come springtime with all the snowpack and everything else turns to ice, and you start to get the melt, and I'm worried about here in the Midwest it just dripping on into the roof and trying to be... Uh, proactive by keeping it off the roof as much as possible. Yeah, I had what I thought. Well, first of all, metal roofs, and that's one of the benefits of metal roofs. The, the snow and ice does slide a lot better, but I had what I thought was a genius idea that I would just take a heater and put it in the observatory, and that would melt all the snow off my uh, observatory roof, and even if I had to leave the heater running for half a day. And no, it didn't. It just cost me like $20 to run the heater for half a day outside in the freezing cold. So uh, I thought that was going to work. But, yeah, I, I think I would have had to have had some sort of heat tape or something underneath the, uh, the roof layer because it's so – at least my observatory is it's not insulated. Air comes in, air goes out. It's, it's the same temperature as outside. So I'm still trying to address that. But uh, I have a leaf blower, so I can go outside and blow the snow off the roof. And that – takes a little bit of time, but I mean it's possible. Um, when the ice gets on the rear, I'm, I'm jammed up. I can't go anywhere. So that's my issue. Hi, Tham. How long have you been in Minnesota? Ten long, wonderful years. Okay, so you do know all about ice dams and all that, that they oh. really don't do 
you right often don't form until <laughs> spring, right? Yep, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Either spring or sometimes a, a nice <laughs> midwinter thaw. And yeah, it's just, yeah, I know. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's been it was seventy two degrees this weekend in Minnesota, which oh, so is gorgeous. I, I'm just over the line in South Dakota, so yeah. Yep. Yeah, so that's what I'm worried about is just because I've been using our uh, the Astronomical Society, Minnesota Astronomical Society's observatory, which has been, I wish I had never used it because now I'm like, damn it, I really, <laughs> really want one. They're awesome. Uh, so I just started thinking about, because in February we'll have, at the dark site will be around four feet of snow, so getting through the snow just to the observatory is a gigantic pain. So I thought about leaving my equipment in there, then I started thinking, well, if I leave my equipment in there, what about the snow dams and everything else, or at least the ice dams, and then potentially heating the roof for them to keep it off, because I don't want to get on a ladder in the middle of the winter and sweep off that snow. Um, even though I'm still young enough and nimble enough, I don't want to keep doing that for the rest of my life. So just trying to think of different ways of... Uh, doing that. Um, I thought I had another question. Did you say you were going to plan on tying that to uh, a weather station by any chance? Um, mine? Yes. Um, I, you know, it's right here at home. I'm definitely going to motorize it with a garage door opener or, mm -hmm. or a, a gate opener of some sort. Um, I'd like to have a weather station just to kind of track the weather and chart the weather. But I don't know if I'd actually automate it with the weather station. I don't. At this point, I am at least uh, striving for some user interaction with the telescope. If I automate, if I automate it totally, totally, then uh, I've completely worked myself out of the system, except for processing, which a year ago I, I would have said is the perfect way to do it. But uh, now I think to myself, oh, I kind of like doing this a little bit. So. Yeah, that's the, the part that I'm trying to reconcile with myself is I love packing up my equipment and driving an hour and a half to two hours to my dark site, setting up, and, you know, I have my cot set out outside, and I love looking at the stars, and that's what I do all night while the equipment does its thing, but at the same time, it's one of those. I just spent anywhere between three to four hours driving to get to my dark site, and then another hour and a half to set up, well, about an hour to set up, and then you take into consideration tear down, down, and everything else, and then the drive back, so... It's one of those things I'm trying to uh, make the decision regarding, but as I stated earlier, it's the, after setting up in the observatory and just leaving my equipment at the observatory with, at our society and just driving to the site, opening up the roof, flicking a couple switches, check polar alignment when I don't screw it up, and then everything's happy. So, interesting. Yeah, if you got that opportunity, I would definitely do that. I mean, that you, yeah, it saves you the setup time and everything, but you still have to drive and everything like that, though. I mean... Yeah, For me, it was the you know, do I want to do the driving, packing up stuff like that, um, or do I deal with the light pollution and having to use the iDAS? Mm -hmm. I dealt with the iDAS, and I, and now I got a happy wife. Now I don't, I can just go out there, twenty minutes, open up the roof, get everything sent, and I'm back in the house and watching TV or whatever with the wife, and just have the laptop to check everything out. Yeah, see, I'll set up in my driveway from time to time because I've got an awesome view from our driveway rather than the yard, but uh, it's still one of those, it's in my driveway, and I know I can check on it from the house, I just still don't feel comfortable falling asleep yet, because it is, you guys know what it's like, it says clear, but at any moment, I don't want to lose, even though I do have insurance on all my equipment, I still don't want to have to go through all that trouble, but... Um, yeah, I was just going to ask, what was the other question I was going to ask you regarding that? Huh. It'll come to me. I have a question while you're thinking about it. Um, for the observatories that aren't insulated, I mean, the main reason I don't keep my stuff outside with, like, a, um, a telegizmo cover or something is I'm more worried about the humidity and all the dew and the moisture in the air, um, especially on the mountain, and mechanical stuff. Are you not, that doesn't cause you any issues, or you're not concerned about that? It hasn't, I mean, I think that I used to keep my telescope, I used to keep all of my equipment outside in my car, in my garage, which is unheated, which is pretty much the same thing. I mean, I guess you would say it, some of the humidity is going to stay out of the car, but I think uh, in general it's, it's pretty close to the same thing. Um, the important part of the camera is sealed, 
with, I think, its own desiccant in there. Um, I have an SCT, which is better protected than a lot of newts. So, uh, I mean, I, if, I, if I was keeping it in my house, it'd be a lot riskier. So, I guess... Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. You have a way off carrying it in and out all the time and stuff. I just, I even my camera, I don't mind bringing that in and out. But I I would love to be able to leave. I always do it in my driveway. I'd love to be able to leave everything out there. I just haven't convinced myself that the weather's okay with it. But it sounds like most people do it. Yeah, I mean, you if you do a overhang with the ventilation, um, you should have no issues um, with that ventilation but, going in there. It keep it all dried out and everything. I've had no issues, and I get a lot of crazy, you know, warmth, dew, snow, rain, you know, coming off the lake. So I get it all, and I've had no issues in the three years that I've had it set up. Yeah, see, I, to me it almost sounds better to do that with an observatory than a telegizmo cover, because then you wouldn't be trapping a bunch of stuff underneath there. Right. <clears throat> yeah, that's that's the issue with the telegizmo cover, is it's, it is trapping all that. So you use it for the night, and it's all dewy. And if you do cover it up immediately, then you're there and you have to do something with it. Um, hey, I, I think I what's his name, Rick? So, does anybody have uh, open tube scopes like Newt's or RC's that they're actually using in uh, an observatory? Because, like, I have a, a, a shed, a wooden shed with a shingled roof, and I can't keep my 10 inch. Uh, Newt out there because the mirror will collect dew every morning, like in the mornings. I've gone out and found it several times, so I stopped keeping it out there. Just it's curious. Like a, like a truss tube or like just an open? It's a sauna tube. It's an old coulter. Um, well, do, do you put like a shower cap type cap over it at all or no? Yeah, I've tried both. Uh, oh, leaving it open and leaving the, the shower cap on there. I don't know if it's just a... Uh, I just assumed it was the mirror retaining the heat and not, not warming up enough so uh, dew formed on it in the mornings. So I had to stop leaving it out there. Yeah, I, I mean, I know our club's RC is a completely trust tube, but I think that's uh, that has fans on it and all that stuff to keep it regulated so I don't know but I mean it stays outside and it's but it has fans so sure yeah yeah about as much as I can answer that question until Just I get a, until I get a nice newt Josh did remind me when he was talking about weather specifically it was the uh, how cold does it typically get where you guys are out in uh, Scranton like are you guys uh -huh. looking at sub zeros quite a bit. Last winter was the coldest winter that I can remember really pretty much in my lifetime and I think my, my record when I was a, when I was imaging and I was pretty much only going out to open the roof I want to say it was like negative 15 Fahrenheit and uh, that was pretty much that was pretty much my record for imaging and that's pretty much the coldest I, I can ever remember it being here. Now was that now that was obviously the outside air temperature. Did you take the inside air temperature of the observatory to see if there was much of a delta between the two? Oh, it was my entire roof opens up. It was the same temperature. Okay. All yeah, right. my my entire so roof you, opens you up. Not, my floor is over air. There's there's no okay. yeah. Because you were not. Uh, um, oh my gosh, I can't. The insulated. There we go. Yeah. Okay. No insulation. No yeah, wall. What... Yeah. No ins no interior walls at the time. All right. Yeah, I'm worried about that as well here, just being in Minnesota. It's just, we've had, we had 50 sub-zero days last year, and I think they're <laughs> expecting the same thing again, and I'm not too keen on that. Um, what's his name? Rick? Rick J. from the CCD Forum. Yeah. He lives in northern Minnesota, so he lives right off of a lake, too. So if you guys have any questions about how much do you got to deal with, ask him, especially in northern Minnesota. It's a pure, humid, humid climate. Um, and I think his, he's never had any problems with his gear at all. Yeah. And he's had, yeah, he's had like uh, a few cameras for a real time. I think he had one for like 10 years or something. Yeah, he's never had a problem at all. Yeah, I mean, with me, if I have a real dewy night, I, what I'll do is I'll just keep the roof open just a little bit since it's in the backyard. 
and if I know it's going to still be a, a, even if it's cloudy, I'll just keep the roof open a little bit to give that a little extra um, uh, circulation of air to make sure everything is good. What about just a simple USB fan that plugs in that you guys can control from, you know, from remote desktop or set it so that it? I think you guys can get an Arduino controller that is tied to like a humidity probe that would just turn the fan on. I know you don't need to go that far, but you could also oh, you just could, have something yeah. as simple as a little fan running in there just to keep the air circulating as well. Because you don't need anything powerful, just enough to move the air around. Right. Would that work? It probably would help. Yeah, you know, my, I think mine is so open air that it probably wouldn't help for me. But okay. I'm, I'm at the point where I, I want to seal it up a little bit better, but not too much better. So I don't know whether to like put all these kind of soffits in and then put massive soffit vents in them. I, I don't know what to do, but I'm planning on doing something. Yeah, that's what I've got. I've got the soffit vent um, all the way on the underside, and then I also have um, the garage door sealer where it's like a, a what is it, the one inch with the little rubber flappy thing. Mm -hmm. um, I have that on the inside part so it seals it completely from um, bugs also. But I still got the vent, um, the soffit vent still allows the circulation of air while I'm closed. Yeah, I see people using the brushes too. But they don't seem. They seem like they might keep some bugs or, or mice out. But I don't know. I don't know about the air. The garage door things look like a little bit better of a seal. Funny how you always feel like you're reinventing the wheel when you're building an observatory. There, there's no one perfect way to do it. So. Oh no, it's it's what you want to have. Because like with mine, I went to um, a couple of the club members' uh, observatories, looked at what they had, and. I just went and created my own, went to the town, said, is this doable? He said, okay, you got to make a couple of uh, adjustments. And he's like, okay, you're good to go. And I built it myself then. Do you guys, um, do you have a flat man in your observatory, or do you just reuse flats, or what do you do? I have a, uh, I just, well, not, uh, about two months ago, I got a Gerd Newman EL panel. And it's not like uh, it's not like the flip flat thing. It's but it's pretty much like a flat man, and um, I just put it on the top and take my flats and then take it off. So you don't automate that? That I don't automate. Um, I mean, I use Sequence Generator Pro for it, but I still slew my telescope, point it straight up, balance the thing on top, and then take the flats. Um, I think those flip flats look awesome, but they're pretty expensive. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you reuse yeah. your flats um, until you change your camera? Yes, and I pretty much reuse my flats. I've been going as much as two, three, three weeks before it kind of gets to me. After three weeks, I start to think, you know what, I'm just going to take a new flats. <laughs> not by any evidence, you just get uncomfortable about it. Exactly. Oh, yeah, not because I see any dust. Or, yeah, just because I don't feel right about it. Exactly. Rather and at that point, I probably image. imaged a couple targets, and I, I might be like saying, okay, it's RGB time, or it's like, because uh, uh, I'll usually shoot HO3, and RGB is kind of an afterthought for me. And then at that point, it'll be a, it'll be a forethought, and I'll be working my way around. So hey, could you mount that flat panel and then use SGP to point at it? Mm -hmm. Y yes, my flat panel though is only eight inches, and I'm not sure. I'm not sure how you'd have to mount it to be able to get it to point at it and still have it evenly illuminated. Um, Does it have to be too close to the scope? Is that what you're saying? It, I think it'd have to be too close to the scope. Yeah, and I think if I put it farther away from the scope, I'm not sure it would work properly. I'm not sure, but. I, it's it's intended to be rested on the top of the scope, so that's the way I've always done it. I went and bought a, just a plain EL panel and you know built out the little box so that way I can um, put it over top of mine, and then I bought a dimmer for it so I can adjust the uh, uh, lightness of it so that way it's not overpowering. And uh, like what you do, Adam, is I just you know point the scope up and put it up on top. But yeah, you reuse my flats also. 
yeah, as expensive those flip flats are after buying mine, it's one of those things that I will never go without again. The only thing that I dislike about it most is its use with the narrow band filters. It absolutely sucks because you're looking at exposures of anywhere between 50 and 70 seconds, depending on how narrow your filters are as well. So wow. it bites. So you're, when you're doing your flats, especially when you're getting up at 6 o'clock in the morning, you got to pack up and you got to head to work, you're looking at another <laughs> 25 minutes just to take flats. It is brutal. It's fantastic for LRGB because you can adjust the brightness from 0 to 255. And typically for LRGB, I keep it anywhere between... Um, I think 15 to about 25, and it's about three-second image. But with HA at 255, a full-blown illumination, it is a 47-second, and that is to reach th a count of 30,000 ADU for my camera. Wow. So it's 47 that's with, seconds, and I do 20 flats, so you can do the math. That's with the tack? Yep. At, like, F... Uh, at F5. F5. Yeah, it even at 3.65, it doesn't make much of a difference. Wow, yeah. oh, because I know with my uh, HA, uh, which is the 5 nanometer, um, I get 8 seconds. That's yeah. all I need. Yeah, the brightness on the flip-flat that I have isn't isn't that great for narrowband. It, like I said, it works amazing for the broadband spectrum, but it's horrible for the narrowband. And so at that point, I've had to start shooting dark flats to account... Well, sorry, I shouldn't say. I, I did in the beginning because I didn't understand how PixInsight was going through. And... Um, and scaling the uh, the flats with the darks. So I was shooting dark flats, which was completely unnecessary because someone had on the CCD forums that I should. But uh, yeah, I've, I'm debating about just going back to using sky flats again because it's a three second shot. Yeah, with the Dirt Newman at F10, I'm seeing 40 second H alphas with the 8 nanometer. So I'm noticing similar, but not quite to that extent. I would expect at F5, you're, you'd be... That seems like a really long time at F5. Yeah, O3 is about 52 to 53 seconds with O3 3 nanometer. It's even worse. So I just... Uh, I'm getting back to the point where I'm just convincing myself to shoot the sky flats. It's no big deal. My only... That's the one thing I wish SGP would do is that if I was shooting at the sky, it would automatically adjust the shutter for, or based on the last reading or the previous two readings and say, okay, I was at X for this time, sun is setting, adjust as necessary. I w that would be really cool. Um, that's my only beef that I have with sky flats is I gotta sit there and just adjust the time so I'm not going from 30,000 ADU to 10, because it's too dark. Well, I know there's a couple of, well, it depends on what you're using. If you're using Sequence Generator Pro, that it doesn't have it, but I know Maxim has that plugin that will automatically adjust as, you know, the, um, as it's starting to get darker. Yeah, CCD AP does too, I think that's right. Yeah. Autopilot? Yeah, CCD Autopilot does it as well. Yeah. Just wish they would put that in uh, SGP, that'd be kind of nice. Is that the equivalent of, like, the AV? setting on a DSLR? Yep. Yes. Yes, sir, you're right. Yeah, it pretty much just determines it. Yeah, it just should be able to detect it because I I figure that with the ASCOM it would report the current ADU count and should just report it back to SGP and SGP would just terminate it at that point. I don't know. I've never looked at the ASCOM um, API. So I don't know exactly what is all available or what is not available. Yeah, it'd have to do something. You'd have to calibrate it somehow. It'd have to know whether it was dimming, uh, whether the sky was dimming or lightning, mm -hmm. um, or brightening, I should say. Um, because with the DSLR, because the way the AV mode would work, it would take a look at the saturation of each one of the pixels and then say, okay, 50%, and then cut off. Um, at least that's my understanding of it, and that could be an incredibly oversimplification. Yeah, I think <clears throat> a lot more goes on with DSLRs. Okay. Because it gets into um, uh, I'm drawing a blank here. It gets into uh, uh, the whatever mode where it's, it's this is the part of the picture where you want it to judge the brightness from. I forget the name of the mode, but uh, mm -hmm. You select it, <laughs> like every mode, yeah. Oh, I can't remember it. 
Uh, but but yeah, a lot more goes on in DSLRs, whereas uh, CCDs are pretty much like totally manual. I mean, mm -hmm. you pretty much tell it the exposure length. You don't get to choose your ISO. I mean, I guess you can kind of choose your gain in some of the cameras, but not really like like in a DSLR. <clears throat> Metering mode. That's what I was looking for. Oh, okay. Yeah, so there's no way to adjust the brightness of that flip-flat, like software or anything, like a gain. Turn it, yeah. kind of turn up the brightness. It does have a brightness setting inside of a SGP. So it goes from 0 to 255, and 255 is the maximum that it will illuminate. Yeah, I think what happens is with narrow band filters, the light that it's illuminating just doesn't happen to lie within that narrow yeah. band. So you're pretty much just hoping for the light that's kind of spilling over into it. Yeah, it's you like I said. hydrogen alpha and O3 bulbs, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it gets brighter. <laughs> yeah, like I said, it works great for LRGB. It's awesome. I'll never go without it again because you just mount it on the top of the scope and you just create your sequence and put it in the flats at the end and SGP closes and it keeps the flat, uh, the flip flat will remain closed as the sequence finishes and you've got your remote cap as well so it's never exposed. The, re the remote cap is like the most attractive part of it to me. Mm -hmm. Even though I like the whole dew heater, I, that remote cap is really uh, the one thing. That's one of the other things I've, another thing I forgot to mention. So if you're living in an area that is high humidity and you're, the likelihood of dew is extremely high, it will collect on that flip flat and it's brutal because it will drip down on your objective when it closes. Mm -hmm. That happened to me with my tack and I'm pissed because now I've got these gigantic dots and I had to, of course, shoot my uh, flats all over again. But something else to keep in mind. If it probably be better in a on a mountaintop in New Mexico or Arizona than it is here in Minnesota. You need to add a, uh, a dew heater to that. Yeah, on the back side, just a small, super low wattage element will take care of it. Another wire. Yep, exactly. More money. <laughs> yeah. I have a question about your, your rails for your roll-off mm -hmm. roof. Uh, those are not one piece like four by fours, right? They're like uh, headers, right? Where there's multiple boards nailed together. How's that made? Oh, you don't have uh, one the, header, foot. Okay, the header on my observatory that that's mounted on top of. Y yeah, I mean you don't have one twenty foot no. board that you roll um, off onto. How are those no. made? The way I did it was the front half. It's it's pretty much a typical header for the front half of the observatory. Let me see if I can pull up a picture. Um, it doesn't show it in that one. I know you can't see it yet. Just wanted to see. Um, no, actually, it doesn't really show it. So uh, the front half of the observatory, the, the half that the roof doesn't slide towards, is just your typical double uh, double header, so two two-by-fours on top of each other. And then uh, behind that, I did a four-by-four that runs all the way across, uh, all the way back, and that's what the roof actually slides on. So the roof slides on a four-by-four. Um, and the 4x4 four four extends back beyond the rear rails. And that is just at the perfectly same height. So what that does is that distributes the weight of the roof when it's all the way back on the front portion of the building. What, so, what's your unsupported span for that 4x4 four four for the roof to roll on? Um, the unsupported span in the rear? Yeah, that it rolls on to. Um... Let me, I'm just going to, I'm going to actually like, I'll switch over and show you kind of a, a partial image here. You think it's like eight feet? Not, not unsupported, no, because there's a rear support on it. Um, I'll show you. Can you see this? You can see this picture here. It's finished. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you see it supports right here. So right here to right here is six feet. Right here to right to this um, to where that notch goes up is another two feet, and there's I think another like two feet beyond that 
but the roof pretty much stops right above this spot right here. So I hope, does that answer your question, or are you asking what the span is? Right, so, it, so it's almost six feet or something, six right? Feet. Six feet, yes. And you've not had any bowing issues or anything like that? Not at all, except I when I got one of these 4x4s, it was almost bad enough that I was going to return it. I had this lumber delivered, and it was almost bad enough quality that I was going to return it, and I decided to cut off the bad end and still use it. And I cut off the bad end, and it was still a little bit more twisted, and I probably shouldn't have used it. But um, I don't know. The lumber yard I used... They would deliver for me, but they were always out of stock of stuff, and they had to order this for me, so I was, I don't know. I just went ahead and used it. Um, you, you didn't do plywood underlay on your roof, right? It's just straight metal on top of no, your uh, furnace? I actually, I actually did use OSB. Uh, I, I think I used OSB. Uh, underneath your metal, right? Underneath the metal, I used OSB, and then I actually used uh, roofing felt. Uh, on top of that. And that I didn't have to use, but I ordered my metal roof. It took three weeks to come in, and I had my telescope in the observatory at that point. Even though I said I wasn't going to use it before uh, I finished, so I didn't count the roof because it took three weeks to come in. So I put roofing felt on it to waterproof, and it was perfectly waterproof, so I was able to keep it in there. And then I put the, that on top, the metal on top. Awesome. Thanks. That totally answered my question. Yep. Thank you. If I, if I could have, I probably would have moved that rear support back further. Uh, you can see I did that little thing, but like I said, I made my observatory bigger at the last minute, and I just pushed it to as far back as I thought would be completely safe. Um, so uh, now I'm trying to figure out how to get... There we go. So did you say that you had any plans on while well, you just said that? And never mind, I just answered my own question by remembering what you had stated. So I guess this is just a general question then for everybody else or that has the observatory or for those that are planning the observatory and done the research. So a question for everybody. I need sleep. Um, <laughs> haven't slept since last night. Uh, or not last night, the night before. Um, so if you plan on motorizing the actual roof on the system itself. Now, I would assume that if we're going to end up integrated with software, say, a la Maxim or ACP, those, or even SGP, because I keep forgetting SGP now has that capability, that would require an ASCOM plugin that is directly attached to that motor. So are, are there specialized motors that one can purchase that must be ASCOM compliant? Or can we also purchase like an Arduino controller, which can talk to ASCOM, which can then talk to the roof by sending a power signal? via on or off. I'm assuming you would have to purchase a motor that is ASCOM compliant or is capable of understanding ASCOM or something that sits in between the two. I think, and I forget the company's name, and they're at NEF every year. I don't know if it's the same company as RoboDome, but they have a product that I believe will control a, a garage door opener, but this particular product is ASCOM, is an ASCOM programmable mm -hmm. device. Okay, so it connects um, to the network or to a USB hub and then can communicate to your PC via ASCOM? Yes, and okay. this becomes like an all-in-one integrated system. I don't know if it's... I don't know if Technical Innovation sells it, um, but they sell like this whole box thing that does all that, all that stuff for you, and if you literally have a remote out-of-the-way observatory, they're the ones to go to. I think it's Technical Innovations. Okay. Um, and I might be wrong about that. I hope I'm not wrong about that. I can't remember. I've heard people use um, those uh, gate slides. Um, yeah. And they're able to incorporate those into the remote um, remote control also. Sorry, uh, Robert, what sure. was that? What was the name of that product? It, it's just, it's a gate slide. Um, oh, it's a gate slide. Okay. Yeah, it's one of those, and you can either do it by... Um, uh, what is it? The gear, the gear and track method, or you can use a uh, a chain, um, and, and I've seen people do it that way. And I've also heard people use the Arduino too. Yeah, gate slides are good. Uh, you can either use gate slides or garage doors. Gate slides, Liftmaster does them, and that's just a gate slider company. Uh, but they're like three, three, four 
dollars some more reasonable. A lot of the other gate sliders are a thousand dollars plus, so they get a little bit expensive. Um, with garage door openers, you can actually use. Um, they all now have something that allows you to do a Wi-Fi link. So even though you wouldn't be able to integrate it with ASCOM, you would be able to open it remotely. Mm -hmm. uh, that that doesn't that gets you halfway there. Uh, if you yeah. want full integration, you're probably better to go with a professional system anyway because it's going to have all of those uh, fallbacks and uh, pretty much all the protection that you're going to yeah. need. Because <clears throat> I've been debating if like, do I just go ahead and purchase the entire weather system, which will then connect and control the roof as well, or do I just build it myself using Arduino controllers? Because I know I I know how to do that part. That's the f the fun in it, but it's also the I like time and time is money as well. So yeah, because that would be the other aspect is I will definitely get a weather station <laughs> to close everything up for me. I love my sleep. Um, I've seen someone trying to do a weather station with the Arduino because um, I was looking at, you know, something to that extent because otherwise you're spending four or $500 on a weather station. For a cheap one, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I think the one that Cyanogen sells is the $1,000 mark, if I remember right. <clears throat> the guys at Maxim. Hi, then we made a, um, a sort of a weather station that also senses light. Um, and we were trying to pick out whether clouds were out or not, and we did a pretty good job of it uh, with an Arduino and Bluetooth, and it controlled a motor that controlled windows and blinds, and I think we spent like a total of $80 on it. Oh, and wow. It worked, and it worked like pretty much flawlessly. Um, awesome. Just bought, bought an old used motor. I found it on eBay for like 40 bucks, and bought the... Uh, Arduino. Because yeah, that's what I was also thinking, doing something similar to that. If you guys go to smarthome.com, because they've got a lot of smart home, uh, like remote automation things, or even, um, uh, I'm going to stop talking. <laughs> so suddenly get this mental block. and I can, um, Motion detection as well. There we go. So I was thinking about just using some of those and just uh, uh, hacking them so that I can end up using those from inside the house. I could just go click, and the roof just opens up from inside the home, you know, prior to going to full-blown weather automation as well. Because I think the guys at SGP ended up building their own weather station, so they were looking at building their own weather station, if I remember right. And I don't know where they, where I, they left know, off with that. I know someone has, and I guess they've had very good success with it, as a, for a cloud sensor, they've used a Peltier and an Arduino for a cloud sensor for um, using with the motor. Because, huh. uh, you know, with the cloud, you know, when it when there's no clouds, of course, it's cooler, but when the clouds roll in, there's a heat differential, you know, changing. <clears throat> and in that change, that's when it'll, <clears throat> excuse me, the sensor will pick that up and, you know, uh, do whatever it is you tell it to do. Mm -hmm. So the maximum... Cloud sensor is two thousand dollars, <laughs> <laughs> and that's the Boltwood cloud sensor too. So that does, I think that does a lot of different. Yep, rain, snow, cloud, wind speed. That's pretty much the ultimate. That's the yeah. That's the one Rick uh, Rick Johnson has. So Rick J on CCD form. He's got the Boltwood. He's in love with it. He thinks it's amazing. I mean. Two grand if you're protecting how many tens of thousands of dollars. I guess it's another wonderful part of this hobby. Couldn't you also just set it up to where if uh, PhD loses a guide star, it just closes your roof? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Instead of sending a text message to you, it just closes the roof. I bet you could do that because if they're controlling it from SGP, because SGP has got an open API where you can script against it, so I'm sure you could send commands to SGP, which would then in turn send it to your to your system. So if you receive an email, you can pass that back to SGP, or you can send it to SGP where at um, like an inbox that SGP would monitor. Then, depending on whatever sent on there, look for the condition, and that could be used as a trigger. So if a time has been reached where Guide Star has been lost for X amount of time. I think I think it'd be possible. No, you just you just put it in your end of sequence options. You turn off recovery mode, and it automatically happens because you lose your guide star. Oh, that's right, because you can do scripting directly into that. Right? Roof. 
That's right. Yeah, I've never used that because you could add scripts directly to the end of sequence options. Alex, that's why Alex last weekend or last week was uh, oh. talking about going out and shutting down his telescope for the end of the night. And one of the things that drove me nuts about Sequence Generator Pro when I first got it was that when something went wrong, it would park my telescope. And I didn't really like think through the ramifications of that. But what that does is when something goes wrong, it parks your telescope so it stops slewing. And um, you don't have to worry about it slewing into anything. So you pretty much, no matter what, at the end of the night, no matter what went wrong or what went right, your telescope's parked. So, And then if you're... if Close the roof is in your end of sequence options. That happens automatically. And I did not think of that. Cool. Good point. Yeah. So never mind my big fancy way, over-engineered way of doing it. Well, it also should be noted, though, that I've had uh, PhD lose the guide star and then pick it up again, you know, five tries later and start imaging again. So yeah. You would have to almost put it like a, a time delay on that or something. To that extent for the script. What's well, like what it is is uh, the cloud sensor would overwrite uh, override recovery mode. So the cloud sensor it sees clouds moving in. It would say it's not going to get clear. Let's override recovery mode and just send it, park it, and close the roof. Couldn't you just use a uh, all weather channel or all weather IP camera and just point it up? You probably could. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what goes on with weather. I don't know much about the weather uh, or the cloud detectors or any of that stuff. I wouldn't trust. I wouldn't trust the uh, losing a guide star to tell you whether or not it's going to rain. I mean, there's times when you can keep a guide star when it looks like it's completely cloudy out. And Has anyone ever lost a guide star? For, does PhD just suddenly lose the guide star for no reason for you guys? Mine does that quite a bit. I it drives me nuts. That issue. It'll just start dinging and I'll go over, look outside, and there's not a cloud in the sky. It just I'm loses PhD the guide star and goes back. Yeah. PhD 2. Yeah, I've had that a couple times, yeah. It, sometimes it's, it's really inconsistent, so I'm always wondering if there's a high enough cloud that causes it, but it happens on the brightest of stars or even, even stars with a low SNR. just pops completely off out of, the, um, out of the guide box, and then all of a sudden it just jumps back in exactly where it was and picks up. You know, thankfully, it doesn't cause huge random slews and ruins frames, but usually loses it for one to two seconds. But goes yeah, right even, back. Even at, even at four second intervals, it still loses it. Yeah, I get that to happen to me. It's mm. like, what's going on? <laughs> Interesting. Okay. I'm not losing my mind then. At least we're in it together. Yes. Good. Those are UFOs, Hytham. <laughs> over your guide star. Yeah, those little bastards. Um, oh, the other question I had, so regarding the observatory for the guys that have them. So you guys have them on fixed concrete piers. So, Robert, yours is the same as well, correct? Well, mine is 16. It, it's a fixed concrete, you know, base that's, you know, 32 by 32 by 40, 44 inches. And, but I use 16 by 16 by 8 inch uh, chimney block. Okay. And that goes up, and then I use a uh, um, half-inch uh, steel plate, um, and then I use my pier adapter on top of that. Okay. So what is the total height in relation to the wall, then, the walls that you guys have around the observatory itself? In, in relation to the wall? or yeah. In relation to the floor, you mean? More? Well, to the walls. I'm sorry, the walls that are around your observatory. Does your pier go... So are your walls 7, 8 feet high, and then your pier is 4 feet high? Just um, out of curiosity. Because I'm thinking of a few other things. There's a reason why I'm asking that. I think I, I think my overall pier height with the pier plate and the little AP extension was 40 inches. It might have been 41 or 42 inches, but I know I put a little bit higher. And my wall height, uh, it's it's escaping me, but it's the lowest height you can have and still use a standard door and um, a double uh, top. Uh, top rail or top beam or whatever they call it. Um, and I'm forgetting what a what the standard door had. So that was that. Have you guys have seen those piers that will um, you adjust oh, what's his name? I think it goes by Chris S D. Yeah. He, I think it goes by Chris S D on on Cloudy Nights. Yeah, I've and heard of a couple of people using those where where it 
you know, it lowers down and then it will jack back up when you're ready to uh, image and everything. Yeah, because one of the things that drives me nuts about the astronomical observatory, the roll-off roof there, but they were smart enough when they put them in. They have seven-foot seven foot walls, and it's awesome for blocking the wind and keeping dew at bay, but if I want to image Orion to the south, I have to, and they, they put in a, a small subsection, about two and a half feet, that can fold down so that way I can hit Orion. So I was thinking, you know, in my future observatory, if I ever have one in my backyard or remote, I would like to be able to at least raise my pier somewhat, but I'm a little concerned about the stability of that pier as it goes, as it raises just to clear the ceiling, or the, the wall height. When I built mine, I had in mind that if I didn't like the height of my pier, I would buy the AP pier extension and just put it right on there. Okay. And I, I didn't want to motorize it. I don't want to deal with that. I think yeah. the AP pier extension is six inches. It yeah. needs six inches of, of downwards leeway to uh, okay. make a mistake. But, the, I mean, those, if you're talking about a bigger amount, those things are pretty cool, the, the, the raise-up ones. Yeah. It does seem like... Overkill? <laughs> a little bit of overkill. It is overkill, but it's also one more thing, mechanical thing, you have to worry about if it breaks, too. Then. It, yeah. Yep, I'm a huge proponent of um, mechanical roll-down windows in cars still. I ask that every time I go look at cars. They all laugh at me and think I'm nuts. I'm like, well, <laughs> my windows will always open. Because <laughs> I know my, my the link that I just put in the chat there, um, my walls are um, roughly five feet um, from the floor up to where the rails are. And my pier, the top of my pier where the plate is, um, or the top of the concrete, whatever, um, that is about four feet. And then I built up that, I made that um, pier adapter that height so my camera wouldn't hit um, the top of the pier. Um, and that allows me to be able to be just above, um, when I put my 8-inch tube on there, I can slew to the east and west and not hit the wall, you know, not see the wall, and I'll be just above the wall and be able to do my imaging to the east and yeah. west. Because my concern so Robert, is not so much... Do you have a, oh, do you have a standard door? What do you mean, standard door? Standard door height. Like, did you just go to a home goods place and get a door or something? Uh, <laughs> uh, that's another image. Um, because I've got a heat room. I've got a heated room in there also. That's my normal entry. You know, it's a 32-inch door that I got in. And then that opening you see there, those are steps that come up into my observatory. I've got four steps that go up into the observatory then. That way all my wires go down underneath there. I don't have to worry about bugs or anything. There's uh, no conduit or anything like that. The only conduit I have is for my electrical. But uh, all the wires are uh, underneath there and I don't have to worry about them. I can add new wires uh, for USB and stuff like that. Um, I got storage underneath there for all my um, uh, uh, Afro gear and everything like that, and it's all dry in there too, and all sealed off. Wow, that is pretty. I just opened up your picture. That is pretty high. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's uh, from the outside. That's about ten or twelve feet. Mm -hmm. So, because I wanted the storage underneath, so, so, also. Yeah. Cool, 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 cool. <laughs> And for those people that say sea gems, you can't do very long images. Um, I've been testing. I get 30-minute subs easily, and I'm going to be testing 45-minute subs. Yeah, you got one of the good ones then. Yes. <laughs> That's what I, I got. Sea Gem DX is the same way. I was one of the lucky ones. I could do 20, 25-minute subs with it. At I was doing 15-minute subs at 2,800 millimeters when I first got it just to, to test. And... It's been great, but it's been sitting in my <laughs> basement in its case for the last year. <laughs> so if anybody wants one, I'll let it go cheap. <laughs> but uh, no, yeah, they're yeah, it's it's hit or miss. I actually wouldn't mind getting that uh, new Paramount uh, Mighty or Mighty or whatever it is, the Mighty T. Mm -hmm. Have you seen that? That's a nice little mount. Yeah, it's a nice competition to astrophysics mount. Yes. The yeah, there's a lot of. Comp a lot of competition in like the premium imagers mounts. All of a sudden, yep. uh, 
if ASA were to drop their prices significantly and get better support here, I hate to say it, but I would be all, oh, I just can't justify $17,000 for a 110 pound payload when there's a Astrophysics 1100 for nine grand. Yeah. And they're two states over from me. <laughs> so, Well, for me, I like doing the wide, wide field, uh, yeah, wide field imaging. So that's my old setup that with the 81 and the uh, DLSR. Now I've got a, the William Optic Star 71 five element um, mm -hmm. with the QH or QA, um, QSI 690 off axis guiding, and I love the wide field, you know, imaging. I don't need, you know, the Paramount uh, MT or MX or M plus whatever it is. Um, that mighty T, it would be perfect for what I for what I'm doing. Yeah. yeah. It's awesome. I, um, don't you feel like you, uh, if you buy a nice new mount, that you have to buy a really long focal length scope? Because yep. that's exactly I, where I am. I mean, I would love to get it after <laughs> physics. I've thought about it, um, or one of those M zeros. But my Atlas works for hour long subs now with the focal length of that, so <laughs> I can't justify it. Yeah, for me, I want a medium length scope. Like I've been. Yeah, I, yeah and for me, like. It's for me. I want a medium length focal focal length right now. So I'm looking at the tech. You know, the tech 140 I think would be an awesome combination with my camera. And then, then of course, I still love Takahashi, but I'm so pissed off at my Takahashi's focuser right now because I'm suddenly developing all sorts of awesome flex that didn't exist before. I'm ready to throw it against the wall. So I'm definitely staying American neck. So if I need it fixed, I can just ship it here in the U.S. Get it back in a couple weeks versus a few months. Um, and that's what scares me about the ASAs as well. If something goes wrong, in the event something does go wrong, I do have to ship it across the ocean depending on, um, you know, of course, the extent of the issue. Yeah. But, and it's direct drive motors, so what do you do if oh something goes wrong? You send it back. You, yeah. can't, you can't work on it. Yeah, we can't fix it ourselves. That's yeah. I'm a tinkerer. Like my, my astrophysics... Um, just from driving around, get because if you the more you carry it, the gears just kind of came out of whack, and it took me two seconds to take two screws out, open it up, remesh the gears, screw it back in, and less than ten minutes, astrophysics was working again, back to normal. So, um, oh, I had one other question. So we talked That's about like the wall. The, uh, it's the roll-up window. Exactly. Yeah, it's absolute easy, beautiful artwork, and. So easy to fix. Nothing complex about that system. It's just very price, precise mechanics in there. Um, I know I had another question for you guys regarding your roll-off roof. So we talked about weather stations, height, heating. Oh, the other question I had. So this relates back to weather, uh, the cold weather, especially um, USB cables being sensitive to it. Have you guys had any issues with USB cables going bad or snapping or breaking? Um, because at least here in Minnesota, my laptop power cables, I have to replace them quite often because they will break. No, I haven't had any issues. With no that. issues at all? I have. Yeah, in, in <laughs> five years, I think I've replaced four cables. So mm. that just goes to show you. Nothing I, breaking? Like, not yeah, snapping, going bad. Okay. Like, slowly going bad. Don't get that cold of the temperatures here in Buffalo. I mean, the, the most I've ever seen, you know, like Adam said, is minus 15, maybe minus 20. But that's not, you know, once the lake freezes over, it's we're golden. You know, it stays at, you know, maybe minus 5 at that. Yeah, I don't know if it's the cold necessarily as much as me. When I say four cables, I don't know if it's the cold or the temperature or the humidity or whatever as much as me constantly moving them, throwing them into my bag, taking them out of my bag. <laughs> Not breaking down. I mean, when when I, when I go out for a mobile imaging night and it's down in like the really cold cold temperatures down like around zero, I will literally pick up my entire cable bundle like it's like a waffle or something and just put it in my car like that because I mean it turns into like sticks you know instead of cables to the point where it's kind of difficult to even guide with it because it gets so stiff. <clears throat> hmm. I guess the only other thing you could do is some sort of heating element wrapped around the whole bundle. You know, that would scare me with interference and stuff. Uh -huh. oh. Yeah, I've thought about that too. And the interference thing was the first thing I thought because I want to do. Uh, so Adam, since you and I have the same mount, because I've gone outside at negative thirty, 
And I think that's about the limit of the astrophysics mount with the stock grease. Have you ever had any issues with it at all? Or? Um, you know, the I had an issue that drove me nuts. I think in February of this year that I never really figured out 100% what it was, and I think it had it might have had to do with my T adapter. It might have had to do with a worm mesh because at the same time I did a worm a, re, a worm remesh and then I switched my T adapter. Never really able to find out what the issue was, and as quickly as it came on, it disappeared, and I haven't seen the remnants of it since. But um, I also consider that it could be some sort of cable binding inside the mount. But uh, I haven't had any issues with through the mount cable necessarily or any, anything really with the mount besides that, and I I'm reluctant to blame the mount. Mm -hmm. So it did. I wish I knew what it was. I I, yeah. I pretty much blamed everybody at the time. I called Celestron asking for help. I spoke to uh, Roland at AP. I asked him for help. Uh, like literally everybody I was reaching out to because it was driving me nuts. It made me miserable for the six weeks I was seeing the issue, and then all of a sudden it disappeared. You even offered a reward. I gave uh, Sean a T-shirt for help. Oh, but I was not happy around town here, so I and I, I had like I have all this new equipment. I had my camera. I had just got my CCD camera. Like I spent a lot of money on astronomy to be considering selling all of my astronomy gear and replacing it with all of the same astronomy gear, just newer. So yeah, yeah. I would. What is the you know for the APs? What's the stock? Um, Grease rated for. I know, you know, for when I go uh, next year, I know when my um, C gems are uh, out of warranty, I'm going to go and hyper tune them and I'm going to use the super lube, which is what, to minus 40, I think it is, or minus 50 or something like that. But yeah, I think I'm wondering what the stock was for the AP then. I think the electronics will go first. I think the electronics are rated down to negative 30. I think on the Mach 1 itself. I've taken it out in negative 30 and it performed fine. There were absolutely no issues with it. Hmm. The, cameras had. Aren't, the cameras aren't supposed to get below freezing or below zero. Yeah, really? my, yeah my FLI will go to negative 30C is what they said. Don't go beyond that. The Santa Barbara's, that's right, are zero, right? Zero Celsius or zero Fahrenheit? Uh, Fahrenheit, I think. Okay. The, the other thing is if you, the, a lot of people were upset. Well, not a lot of people. I don't want to generalize. Some people who image up in the far north, like in Alaska and stuff, were talking about how S big doesn't care about them because you can't actually control the temperature on the camera if the ambient is colder than negative 30 because, mm -hmm. because it, you can't cool it less than negative 30. Is that what they mean by California stupid or whatever it is? Yeah, that term I hear. Do you remember that? Yeah. Is that what it is? Is that what people are referring to? Because I didn't get it at first, and I thought, oh, oh, okay. <laughs> it's funny. I I don't even own an SBIG anymore, but I still uh, subscribe to all those emails. I find some of them pretty entertaining. Yeah, they were sold, so we'll see what happens. I got good customer service from them previously, but uh, and I did, I did as well in the future. So we'll see. I did as well. I think the uh, recent quality stuff had me worried a little bit. That was what pushed me towards the QSI. That 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 uh, eats at me every so often because I've had what I still think are some firmware issues, um, but they've resolved them. So we'll see. The, um, the one thing that I did get talking to SBIG, um, it's a really, really interesting point, was that you should not be taking darks in your refrigerator, which I didn't know. Because I always thought that that was good. You know, it was nice and cold. The camera doesn't have to work hard, and it's definitely going to be pitch black. And they were telling me, apparently, the um, ambient temperature actually does have an impact on the, uh, the sensor temperature. It's not actually what you're getting from it, so it can be off by a few degrees. And so you should have sets of darks for every, like, 40 degrees in Fahrenheit. <clears throat> I think Mad Ratter noticed something like that a while back. I don't know if it was, 
I don't know if it was his darks or his biases, but there was some variation depending on the temperature. And he has the SBIG, uh, yeah. I think it's TF. Is that on all CCDs or just the SBIGs that you're noticing? I think, that it, on? I think it's all CCDs. Hmm. <clears throat> you spend all that money and you expect them to be perfect cameras and they're more temperamental than anything else. But mm -hmm. Some of them are more temperamental. I guess the SBIG users are looking at the temperamental cameras and then the FLI and the QSI users seem uh, perfectly happy. Or maybe I'm just saying the grass is always greener. <laughs> I I could not be more pleased with my purchase. It just has been fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I absolutely love, you know, yeah, it was a big chunk of money and, you know, I'm still paying the wife off on it, but, uh, <laughs> um, you know, the honeydew list. But uh, it was well worth the money. Um, and then, you know, I was going through the, you know, one-shot color or mono, and I'm really happy I went with the mono too, even with imaging in a red zone. It's it's funny too because I probably saved over a thousand dollars on getting filters that were smaller than the S big ones. So the whole set, I mean, the camera itself was the same price as the S big, and then saved a thousand dollars on filters. So I mean, that was. Did it was you one point two five or the thirty one millimeter? Yeah. I'm sorry, you cut off on that. Um, I have the one point two five, and that's only because they came with them. I am. In the process of trying to swap everything out over time, I want to go to the 31 millimeters because I've made several telescope decisions uh, not to get telescopes because I couldn't go faster than that five, which is really annoying to me, and I don't know why I did that. Yeah, because I talked to Kevin and uh, I told him, you know, I want to do wide field to eventually go down to, you know, that William Optics, which is a 4.9, but I also want to do uh, um, camera lenses too. And uh, he said, yeah, definitely go to 31 millimeter. Yep, yep. It's definitely the way to go. I put my baiters up for sale right now. So when I'm in no rush to sell them, but whenever they sell, I'm going to go to the 31 millimeters. <clears throat> How, what's the back focus distance on the QSIs? How do they take camera lenses uh, with, the, with, the, uh, with guiders? With the guiders, you can't. Can't. Same as the yeah. You can, you just can't use the um, Canon ones. Pentax makes a right. couple of lenses that are pretty good. That's that right. You can use. Eric Coles, I don't know if you yeah. remember his name, but he uses the Pentax, and they have one of those feather touch camera lens focusers um, that you can put on there. <clears throat> the, the focuser is expensive. I think that's like an $800 job or something like that, but the... Uh, Lenses aren't too bad. I think they're really good, and they're like two or three hundred bucks or something like that. <clears throat> yeah, that's why I haven't got that yet either. I'd really like to get one of those, but can't go that fast yet. <clears throat> yeah, I'm still. I'm always keeping my eyes open for a nice, uh, either Canon 180 to 200 millimeter focal length or uh, Nikkor, the older Nikkor 180 millimeter. That one that uh, Scott, sorry, that one Scott uses is pretty awesome. Scott Rosen. Yeah, is he using the Nikon mic or is he using the Canon? The Canon. Yeah. Although I guess you probably couldn't get that to work without get taking out your off-axis scatter. No. Yeah, if it has to come out. I'd also consider a macro lens because uh, give up a little bit of focal length for a macro lens, something that'll double during for terrestrials. Yeah. yeah. And uh, portraits, for that matter. Oh, I, I forgot to tell you, my dad tested out the uh, new William Optics scope. He has the same camera setup as you. He said that there is literally maybe a millimeter and a half or two millimeters of room to spare for focus. And he was shooting RGB, so. Well, okay. Uh, so hopefully the temperature or whatever doesn't uh, bring that in to get you to where you can't get in focus. But it looks nice. William Optic Star 71. Yeah, here I can yeah. post a link to that. Uh, because I, I had to get a um, Anthony from ADM. I went over, he's just over the uh, road from me. And uh, I had him build a custom uh, adapter to go on the front of the QSI so I can connect right to the uh, um, uh, focuser uh, or the, the draw tube. Uh, that was the only way I was able to get that thing to focus. My dad got a. Uh, 
zero uh, zero back focus adapter from precise parts. I that, saw that. Yeah. Here's uh here's the picture his first light with that camera. <clears throat> nice. So that's that's yeah. your field of view, Adam. That's perfect. Well, that's exactly what I was expecting. We're um, we've both been debating back and forth. He also has the AT sixty five, and somebody pointed me to a reducer that supposedly will work for MoPT, a point seven reducer. So he was going to sell his, and I think he's going to delist it because we we're going to try that as well. That would get it down to like f four point five or something, and a little bit wider yet than the William Optics. Um, but I would be concerned not having the autofocuser. Uh, the moonlight. Oh, that fast, definitely. I'm actually tempted to take off my uh, 71, send it down to Ron Newman from Moonlight, because uh, I've talked to him uh, about getting um, the uh, focuser for that, and he said he doesn't have the threading for it. So I talked to him about me possibly just sending my scope down to him um, so he can start creating them. Because uh, the autofocus is the way to go. <laughs> yeah, I actually had the same conversation with him this week in case I ended up adopting that scope. He was me, me too. Responsive. Oh, did you? <laughs> maybe <laughs> maybe two weeks ago. I don't know because I got my I I knew my scope shipped. I mentioned it to him, and then uh, I got my scope. It had a scratch. It went back. Oh, that's and uh, yeah, and I think I'm waiting till November. So. Sometime in November, William Optics is going to pick one out for me himself. So, well, who did you order from? I got it from High Point, and they're good. Uh, they didn't, no questions asked. They said we'll take it back. Um, they had another one in stock that they were going to send me. They opened it up and looked at it, and they said it has kind of a similar scratch. We'll, we'll do whatever you want us to do, but what do you want us to do? Yeah. And, uh, I said. Uh, have have William pick out as those I'll be happy with, because they also have and I I don't know it's kind of odd if you go onto the website they have some odd dis descriptions of what scratches are supposed to be acceptable on the Woe Star, and they imply that it's uh, coding from coding, but it I don't know it doesn't I don't want to like start anything but it doesn't make a lot of sense to me because what scratches are caused by coding like. All of my telescopes are coding. My Zenith Star 66 is coded, and there's no scratches on, on that. I don't quite get it. Um, yeah. I did notice that the lens is uh, probably because of the new design, like magnify the lenses themselves. So maybe it makes any scratches more apparent within the telescope itself, kind of like an eternal mag or an eternal flashlight shining in it. But um, but I don't think I, I at the same time I don't think I was kind of over exaggerating the scratch. It was, I just looked, at, I opened it, I took the dew cap off, I was like, oh no. Like without even thinking about it. At it first I thought it was a big like hair going across it, but it was a scratch. So On the lens itself? Uh, on the lens, the rear, the rear element, I can't tell, I didn't take the lens out, but I can't tell whether it was on the rear of the rear element or the front of the rear element. Wow. But it wasn't on the top of the scope. Yeah, because when I did mine, I ordered, I emailed uh, um, William Optics directly, and I, I actually was lucky um, because when I called uh, High Point, or was it a gender, I forgot who it was, they're like, oh, yeah, it's going to be a couple of months, blah, 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 and I emailed William Optics, and they're like, yeah, our next shipment's coming in next week. Yeah, just do, our, do a PayPal, and we'll ship it out next Friday. So I was lucky. I got it pretty quick. Yeah. You know, well, I would never want to start anything either. The thing with William Optics, I don't get. I mean, they're, when their scopes are good, they're awesome. Um, my dad's scope is awesome. He's got the 110 TMD. I mean, that's it's an awesome scope. But I've also read of many of that same scope that just didn't work very well. Um, and then same thing with these uh, Star 71s. The ones that work seem to be awesome, and but it also seems like. Like there's a few out of the gate. They just seem like they have manufacturing issues or something. Yeah, it's like any product, you know. It's the same thing with the, you know, Hytham was saying with the C gem, you know. I, I was just gonna say the same. <laughs> you have to be consistent in manufacturing. Anybody can can uh, 
keep trying and get it right eventually. But to keep trying and get it right every time, that's what really puts them apart. And that's well, why we have tax and APs and uh, all those guys. And uh, I was hoping for a tack killer with a thousand dollar William Optic scope. I haven't got to use it yet. I'm still hoping it'll perform for me when I get it. But it, it won't be a tack killer. It'll be a William Optic mm -hmm. scope for a third of the price. So. Yeah, I'm. I'm also tempted just to get a baby Q. Yeah, I'm seeing some of those images those guys are putting up with that. Oh, <laughs> makes my mouth water. Yeah. Yeah. Pinpoint stars. Yeah. I mean, every single one of Python's images. Yeah, but it's then, true. I was looking at that. You need to take advantage of the whole field of view, so you really, really need the 1600 chip uh, yeah. camera. It's not enough to just have the telescope. <laughs> it's like the whole mount telescope thing. Like, I mean, why, why even? That was what I said to myself. Because like, I even considered getting the little FS60 Q, or, and I was like, I, I'm not even going to be, you know, taking advantage of hardly any of this field. What's the point? <laughs> um, yeah. Got to upgrade everything at once. All right, guys. It's actually midnight right now. We do have six viewers on, and I want to thank them for stopping by. Uh, or, or watching. Um, I have to get up early to bring my son to school in the morning, even though my my days off are coming. But uh, I'm gonna probably have to drop out soon. Uh, I don't know if any of you guys had any last points to bring up before I break the the, the live broad. Or excuse me, the uh, the YouTube broadcast. There was uh, one question on the thing that, um, for the upcoming events if they could do uh, different types of drift alignment. Yeah, we were working on that. Uh, I was actually working on that with John Riston. Nothing happened out of it. Uh, so maybe we could. Um, that's one of those things that I think really works well when you're actually doing it as opposed to recording it, but it's also impossible to schedule those things. Right. Um, so I may it may take some creativity on our part, but definitely a good topic. I would highly recommend that uh, go to Cloudy Nights and go to, I think it's in Mounts, that uh, PhD to um, the bookmark method that works. Yeah, that's John Rista's. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's in beginner and intermediate imaging. I believe. Yeah, that's a really good tutorial that he put on there too. Real good write up. All right, guys. Thanks for coming in the in the uh, YouTube broadcast. But I'm gonna cut you out now. My apologies. <laughs> <laughs>